systems nominal. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking to a man with a great deal of experience in the tabletop gaming scene and, frankly, a great deal of experience with subjects that interest me quite fondly. We're talking to Mr. Robert Dubois. He is the man in charge of DreamPod 9. The last person we talked to had been the line director of uh, DreamPod 9's Heavy Gear line, Nick, uh, Nick, back in the day. Now we're talking to his boss. Robert, first of all, thank you for coming on board. Uh, no problem. You know, it's like it's always great to talk to people. Yeah. Normally, we only get out and talk to people at conventions. You know, it's nice to talk to people online as well. Well, you know, that's, you know, I'm glad you said yes. And also, thanks for a whole many years of gaming. I mean, you've been with uh, DreamPod 9 practically since the beginning. You know, I think almost uh, since just after it broke off from, uh, what was the, uh, Janus uh, Publishing? Was the, uh, yeah, Janus like... Publications. Yeah. Oh, Janus I Publications. was actually there before. I was the copy editor for Protocol Tradix Magazine at one point. Beyond, uh... Well, there you go. I mean, yeah. You have been there with this company for an exceedingly long time and it provided me with, you know, quite a few settings that I greatly enjoy. So first off, thank you for that. Oh, no problem. It's like being an anime geek, you know, like a gaming geek, you know, since forever, you know. So it's when you get to a job that allows you to do what you love, it's, it's a great thing to have. Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, to be fair, I am more of an RPG and, you know, tabletop geek than I am an anime geek. So it's pretty much your stuff that helped me get me into giant robot anime. So... You know, we've, that. Always, we've always been inspired, you know, like you, we've like with, with protocol tradics way, way back, you know, then Mecha press. Mm -hmm. And then at one point we decided to break off dream pod nine into a, its own entity from Yanis publications. And since then that was back in 1995. So it's 28 years or so now. Yeah. That's, that's a hell of a run. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I'm the only one of the original crew that's still left at the company, you know, like uh, everybody else is off working computer games, you know, like in other mm -hmm. industries now, you know, so it's like, I still enjoy doing the computer game and I actually, or not the computer game, the, uh, the RPG tactical miniature game side of things. And yeah. I own the company now. So I basically bought out my four partners, you know, like, and they've moved on. But I kept on doing the same thing. Yeah. And I'm having fun with it. So tell me about how this whole thing started uh, back there in, in you know, 95, the, you had uh, Yanis publications. What did caused you and the others who started this thing to get started in this business? Well, back before we had Yanis Publications, which was doing Protoculture Addicts and Mecha Press Magazine. Mm -hmm. And we had which are more like fanzines for, you know, the Mecha anime genre and stuff like that. Yeah. And we had been doing a licensed products for Altar Archaeosaurian games under the title Yanis Games. You know, so we were DreamPod 9 was actually just a design team, which we call ourselves DreamPod 9, working inside of Yanis Publications, which was doing Yanis Games. And they did games for Cyberpunk, licensed for Vampire, you know, for Cyberpunk uh, 2020, from mm -hmm. Art Alsorian, Mekton, you know, and we decided, you know, like, uh, that we wanted to do our own stuff. We had even worked, the team worked for uh, Kevin Simbita over at uh, Robotech doing the Macross 2 deck plans and some other books for him. You know, so it's like, cool. we were into, into the gaming and into the anime, and it, generally said oh let's stop working for other people and do it all ourselves you know yeah. and uh, you know the rest is history you know we came up with an eight with heavy gear and actually before heavy gear came out we had a heavy gear fighter card game which mm -hmm. launched the heavy gear universe yeah you know, came in a kind of like vhs uh, tape uh, yeah, yeah box and one of our partners at the time uh, jean carrier came up with the idea for a game called video fighter which was sort of like doing street fighter but as a card game and uh, that led to Heavy Gear Fighter, which came out before Video Fighter. And it's, you know, it got the designs done for all the robots, the basic uh, designs for the North, fast card game, and it wasn't collectible. It was like, you got all the cards in one box, and we right. added some new cards uh, later on as expansions. And even we had uh, allowed companies like White Wolf that had their, uh, their magazine. We actually got them to publish additional cards for the game and a few other places we put cards in back then, you know. And then that led to the, the following year, like in in 95, we released the RPG, or the role-playing and tactical game. Yes, yeah, so which, uh, you think I remember. It's currently upstairs. I was reading it before I came down here. Every time I talk to somebody about Heavy Gear, I leave my copy of Heavy Gear First Edition somewhere else. This is becoming a, pretty much a habit of mine, I'm afraid. But yeah, that is uh, that is one of my little prized possessions there. But before you did that, there was another game, that uh, another sister game to that, uh, Jovian Chronicles, that came out for the uh, Mekton system. Yep, and... Yeah, we, we did that, but when we, at one point, 
we um, there was some friction between us and our Talisorian games, you know, because of the one of our staff at the time talked online about something, about a problem that was with the, the Mekton system and how to fix it. And they didn't like that because uh, down in the States, uh, you can't admit that you make a mistake. You know, it's all legal stuff, you know, like you can get sued, whereas Canada is much more civil, you know, like, and, you know, we well, can we're basically more polite talk. about it at the very yeah. least. So we decided since we can't, you know, like we're not going to invest a lot more time into Jovian Chronicles, where we put a lot of work into that, you know, mm-hmm. let's go and do our own thing. And that led to the development of heavy gear, you know, to, to basically create our own heavy gear or giant robot game, you know, RPG slash miniature game. Cause we saw that uh, miniatures, you know, like we're also the way to go. A bunch of our guys were into games workshop, you know, playing Warhammer yeah. 40 K. I mean, Lord knows know. they've made a mint on the, on the whole oh, yeah. industry. It's like, oh, they, they learned how to make a, a you know, like they, they've got the plastics before anybody else, you know? So it yeah. was all right. You know, like the plastics were safe compared to when we started, you had pure lead miniatures back in the day, you know, and then California uh, came out with some some laws about not having lead, you know, like in the, in their toys for kids. It's so a good reason to, one can admit. So we had to go to you know, like pewter, you know, which still has small bits of lead in it, you know, but it's nowhere near, you know, it's like uh, what you'd get, you know, as a full lead miniature, you know, anymore. You yeah, because I don't think any of the actual gaming companies are going full lead free miniatures still, because yeah. if you do the pewter becomes very crystalline and whenever you bend the piece, it just snaps off and breaks. Yeah. There's definitely probably some other materials that they can use, but they're maybe just too cost prohibitive. They wouldn't be able to make any kind of profit from selling those. Yeah. Made res- well, that was us. You know, we went into the, into the pewter, you know, and uh, set ourselves up to, at the start, we actually had Rafam doing our miniatures when it was, when we were initially started, it was a HO scale, 187 scale. Mm-hmm. And they even did some of the bigger pieces like the mammoth, you know, and that weighed oh close to five pounds of lead because it was all done in lead at the start. <laughs> yeah, you could kill somebody with it. You know, it's like it's that big. You yeah, you could give a person a terminal case of lead poisoning just by dropping it on their head. Yeah, and then we took back the uh, the miniatures in house and started doing it ourselves. You know, so and we switched the scale to one one forty fourth, which is a very popular Japanese model kit scale. Mm-hmm. You know, if people have seen the, lots of kits from Macross and all that in the time, you know. So we decided to go that way, and it ended up where a gear, one of the uh, you know fighting robots, where a pilot is sitting in the torso, you know, ends up to be about thirty-two millimeters tall, which just happens to be about the same height, you know, like as twenty-eight millimeter for you know fantasy figures, or mm-hmm. you know, you got the Games Workshop Space Marines, you know, about twenty-eight millimeter tall, and so yeah, so it ends up close to that, and we decided to go with everything in scale. So that means when you get you know uh, a small gear, it might be. 28 millimeters tall if you get a big strider it's going to be you know like maybe 46 millimeters tall you know like twice as tall yeah you know, and you know keeping all that to, to scale you know and uh, as we went forward and with the designs we, we learned things you know like you learn everything where you learned first how to do pewter miniatures you know and how yeah. thick the part has to be so it doesn't bend then eventually you know as we move forward in time you know like we had you know plastic injection molding yeah, you know, and you learn first plastic injection kits we did. It's a learning factor, you know, like where they're kind of stiff poses. Then we did the second Kickstarter to, to have more kits. You know, we learned, we made them better. And now this year we're getting into 3D printing, you know, nice. like fully, you know, like because we, we also have resin casting at the office, but, you know, like 3D printing eliminates the making of the molds, which saves a step and also eliminates a lot of the cleanup that you have to make, you know, because uh, when we started doing 3D printing, you know, there's yeah, a learning like, process involved as from oh, it, some other friends who've uh, gotten into this stuff. Oh, well, I, I was talking to uh, Ed over at Reaper Miniatures, you know, like, and they were some of the first to do 3D printing with their cav line of miniatures, you know, again, giant robots, you know, mm-hmm. and the, fir- they, the first 3D printing they got done, you could actually see the steps, you know, like where the striation was, you know, because it was about half a millimeter resolution. Yeah. You know, and you go, okay, step, 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 step. And slowly over the years, now it's gotten better and better. You know, like, and finally this, this year we pulled the, the, the plug, uh, the, pulled the, the cord on, you know, basically said, okay, let's get ourselves, you know, like a couple of 8K printers and start doing it ourselves. Yeah. I know you what know. you mean about the kind of striation it can cause. I was down in the States one time visiting some people and uh, we went to a mall and someone was still selling a bunch of like 3D printed plastic stuff. So there was actually like dice towers for RPGs and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. But it, you could definitely see it, it looked cool. It had that kind of, like, 
it was done in such a way as that they took this striation into account. So it kind of gave it a cool effect. But you could definitely see now as you mentioned, like, yeah, each layer as things were like put together as it was being printed. Yeah. So, yeah, but we, we've seen it over like when it started off, you know, like in those printers, like you had companies like Shapeways online. They still they're still around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the only way to get stuff 3D printed because a 3D printer, when they first came out, they were like twenty thousand dollars for a printer. Yeah, that's yep. always and the problem with any kind of new technology. The first prototype versions are extremely expensive. And then as the mass production kicks in, then you can start to get the price go down to something that's affordable to someone. Yeah. And if you're doing a large, like a, a large building, that sort of quality was fine because you had to sand it down anyway. Mm. But when we were talking about, you know, the miniatures we're doing that are, you know, 32 millimeters tall, you know, like an raised detail, say for a, a little bolt, you know, like uh, on a, on a plate there that shows like an hour plate being bolted on is just, you know, 0.2 millimeters height. <laughs> You know, like, and it's maybe 0.3 millimeters diameter. You know, well, if your resolution at the start was, you know, like 0.5 millimeters, well, your your stepping was larger than the detail. And if you try sanding it down, well, goodbye detail. Oh yeah, it's like, uh, but we we have a we have a little secret weapon for that. You know, like since way near the start of the company, we've been uh, we've had Alain Gadbois, Gadbois. You know, like uh, here he basically is doing all of our resin casting for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and he can basically, he's a master, you know, like model maker. And so if, if you've gone to museums here, you know, like the Space Museum north of Montreal, or you've gone to the planetarium, you know, like, or the, the, uh, the, uh, what is it? The, uh, my brain is not working right now. <laughs> you know, I'm forgetting like books. The, forgetting not the locations. biodome, but you know, biodome. like the, yeah. the, uh, with all the, the gardening and all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like at the... Jardin Botanique and stuff Yeah, like Jardin Botanique, yeah. You know, there's actually a mock-up there, you know, about 20 feet by 10 feet of the greenhouses and all that. That's him that did that back, you know, like nice. over 30 years ago. You know, like uh, he, he would do stuff like skyscrapers, you know, like uh, where, you know, for a building being built and go, go put on the 30th floor, he'd have a guy sit it down at the desk reading paper, you know, like that was only, you know, 12 millimeters tall. Damn, that's some pr impressive work. Oh, yes. But that's a skill set, you know, like over 30 years of casting resin, you know, like uh, the stuff that I've seen him doing, you know, it's like you go for big companies have used his skills before 3D printing came in, mm -hmm. or even when it started coming in, they, they get a thing 3D printed and it would have all these steps on them, you know, yeah. and they go and hire him to go and fix it up to make it castable, you know, like uh, because he'd clean it, sand it, you know. Yeah, and he's got what, the, the experience and the manual dexterity required to actually make something presentable and usable. Yep. And it's the skill of, of how you pour resin. Yeah. You know, like, because I've seen him do stuff like restaurant here in Montreal, decided it want to have uh, an old style turntable inside a block of amber resin. So that he was using like amber, transparent ye yellow resin, you know, and the turntable is fairly sizable, you know, like, so it ended up the, bro the block that he put it in was over six inches tall you know so you can't pour that in one time as soon as you go over two inches your your so your resin warps you know because of the heat it generates so we had to do that in a, about five pours you know like over several days so it cures Damn. it sets and you be, and he managed to do it with no air bubbles no hair no dust in this thing wow that's impressive oh that, that's a skill that he has you know? yeah yeah you know, I mean, so he's like, been doing you know it's one thing to do something on that scale, but to also do it with no imperfections like that, that is some masterwork right there. Yeah. So, so when we started getting 3d prints done, you'd have some of these problems that would happen. The little nubs that, mm -hmm. that, uh, when they get 3d printed, it's pulled out of the resin or, you know, so forth. Yeah. And he had the skill to, to, uh, clean those things up. And if by accident, he scraped off a detail that had to be there, he would just go and sculpt it out of styrene and paste it back on. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Well, there you go. I mean, <clears throat> in this case, you're not just talking about someone who can, you know, do the sanding and the finishing, but it's also someone who can actually do the sculpting. So when something does go wrong, he can fix it as opposed to having to go back from scratch and reprinting the whole thing and starting all over. Yeah. So yeah. That's so, and now he's now he's got have. 3D printers in his place. You know, like we basically set him up with everything, you know, and go, you know, go ahead, play with it. <laughs> Learn yeah. all the ins and outs. Yeah. Cool. So talk me through this. How does how do you guys at DreamPod Nine actually go from initial concept down to the finished model? Like, what's your process for you know creating a whole new miniature? 
Well, it's actually got lots of steps, you know, like, because for me, I'm looking at it for, okay, we, things have slowed down for X lines of miniatures. We should move forward the storyline, you know, add in a new faction. So we'll get new players that want the new design of robots, you know, because you've got North and South are very similar. One square blocky, you know, most of the stuff on Terra Nova, you know, is square is, is a standard robot design. Mm. You know, Which and then makes we sense because it's all the same planet and it's all derived yeah. from the same technology. And that's why, you know, like when we went and did Caprice, we had like the uh, Mohab uh, design, which is a crab-like walker. Mm -hmm. And we had a bunch of other designs, which we just actually brought out. We Now we're calling them the uh, the Saru, the Rabu, the uh, Maru, and the Zikaru, which yeah. were eventually called the big boy, the fat boy, you know, like the little boy. You know, they, they sort of look like eggs, you know, with, we, with, uh, with legs back yeah. then. You could recon that as just those being the nicknames people gave them. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got came up with better names, you know. Like, and you know, again, we, they're now three D modeled. There, there are actually some of our first three D printed miniatures, you know, mm -hmm. because we're able to make them look nice, you know. But at yeah. a certain point, we we were looking at them back then and said, "Well, are people going to buy that?" You know, and and then we said, "But we've got these designs for, say, the Moab, which is a big crab like walker. Let's go more the style of, say, Ghost in the Shell with tachikomas and stuff like that, you know." But yeah, spider tanks. But we but we don't do exactly that. Like every time we do stuff, you know, like heavy gear was inspired by armor trooper votums. Yes. You know, like oh, yeah, you definitely, had for the, yeah. For the height of the robots, you know. You know yeah, but, and the secondary movement systems, the yep. general uh, level of lethality, because you know, just like in heavy gear and votoms, you get hit with something heavy, your robots getting blown the hell up. Yeah. But we decided not to go with the uh the cable, like the polymer cables and the blue you know, like blood sort of hydraulic fuel fluid yeah. that, that's in there, you know, like, and just said, let's go and have a high tech weaponry, you know, a high tech engine that basically provides electricity and hydraulic power to move all the actuators, you know, and hence the heavy gear was born, you know, and it yeah. just happens to be, you know, about 15 feet tall, which is about the height. Well, votums are a little bit smaller, about 12 feet tall, you know, yeah, because a pilot is really wedged in, in a votums, yeah. Yeah, it was, des they were designed to be as uncomfortable looking as possible, I think. Yeah. Not to mention all that hydraulic fluid that's running through them is also, as it turns out, extremely flammable from what I found out. So, yeah, that's the reason why those damn things are death traps. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like, a, and <laughs> for everybody, when we, when we, we, Kiriko. we happened to see like back, you know, before Heavy Gear was was through all his design phase, like back, I think it was in 94, you know, like where we had seen a video of a new thing called a V engine. There was a group in the United States at a university that had basically developed this high fuel efficiency engine. You know, like that provided, you know, like a V type turning, you know, pressure thing, you know, and it could burn just what any type of fuel. So we said, oh, let's incorporate this into the, uh, into the idea of heavy gear, have a high, high fuel efficiency engine that could burn alcohol, petroleum products, anything that, that can burn could be burned in it. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And that way we could be differentiating ourselves again from other things that we were familiar with. Like we, we had a lot of our guys which were involved with battle tech, you know, like when you look into our core rule designs from back to the start, you'll see names like uh, Stefan Mathis, Brent Carter, Jean Marcel, you know, they have combined, they've written four or five, you know, like Battletech books back then before they joined our team. Yeah. You know, and we didn't want to have the same thing as what Battletech had. Yeah. With, which are you know, like, engines. Well, it's, it, it ends up same problem of, you know, like they're fighting with fusion engines, which are nuclear, you know, so it's 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 an irradiated irradiated planet, you know, with yeah. one city on it. You know, well, luckily uh, it's fusion and not fission. Fusion engines will typically just poof out poof out if the magnetic ball is broken. So there's yeah. at least that you don't have to worry about things going kablam almost. Yeah, time. but you know how that game? Did you you must have played classic BattleTech? You know, where inevitably inevitably it always goes to death from above. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's more a question of somebody stepping on your cockpit. But then again, they did pretty much make everything in uh, MechWarrior Four and onward explode and cause damage, splash damage whenever you uh, detonated an enemy mech and you were next to it. Everything gets stacked pulled pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, I don't mind. Fun. It's fun, but you know. It's not one thing I definitely like about heavy gear and about all the you know science fiction RPGs that you guys have put out over the years is that there's a great deal of verisimilitude in both the settings and you know the system that goes with them to for the most part where you get the feeling like okay we're dealing we're still dealing with sci-fi so there are certain you know suspension of disbelief required but there's far less of it required than in other comparable science fiction settings to to my degree yeah well most of the the setting you know like is a, is dealing with adults you know, in war, 
you know, like it's not, whereas even though like, say going back to the, the Jovian Chronicles game that we did, it was our take on, you know, like Gundam, mm -hmm. you know, but a Gundam always inevitably has, you know, like a kid Teenagers. piloting the robot and being the superstar. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, like, but uh, we didn't believe in that. We said, you know, it's like, it should be somebody that's skilled, you know? Yeah, but, it should be somebody who doesn't require getting slapped around by the superior officer to get their ass shit and yeah, shit and gear, or or to be genetically genetically engineered to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like do types and all that from yeah. from there. But hey, we can't we can't control stuff with Hollywood anyway. When we eventually licensed, you know, like the the game rights, you know, for Activision to do computer games, and we licensed for with Sony Family uh, Family Home, Home Entertainment to do the TV, TV series. We had uh, what we what were called meaningful consultation rights, which meant, hey, we're going to have a young teenager pilot a gear and become the superstar. Um, but but you know, it's like, uh, but, what does that mean? It means take some take the money and uh, be quiet. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. So they added in dinosaur gears, you know, in, in one episode. They had oh, gears boy. on hoverboards, you know, and the fans were asking, "It's like, you know, where is this in the uh, canon storyline?" It ain't, you know. So we came up with a a canon storyline for the. The TV series. It's a reality explain. show, people. It's yeah. a reality show. A yeah, very a... bad one, and the <laughs> producer <laughs> ran away with the money. Yep. <laughs> oh man. I mean, because... Baltic had to do the same thing with their cartoon too. So. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's the way Hollywood is, you know. Like unless you get those the rights to actually be the the producer of the show, you know, where you have the final say on the imagery and the storyline, mm -hmm. and we we can see now, like, look look what's happened to Star Wars. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> Could you have ever believed what's come out in the last couple of years? Yeah. No, honestly, oh well, no, no, I can believe it. I can believe somebody would have driven over the dump truck with the money to George Lucas's house and figured some way of doing it. Yeah, and, and then you know, like they just go, "Okay, what's the worst thing we could do for the for the franchise? Let's do that." Yeah, yeah, it's like. Uh... You know, like that th th they didn't get all the cast and crew together in that first. You know, show, you know, like, you know, we'd have Luke and Leia and Han and Chewbacca and all that in one scene. Nope, we can't do that. Of course That's not. That's what everybody wanted. <laughs> uh, this is something that I've been, ever since the word subverting expectations entered the vocabulary, I'm thinking, okay, don't do that. Don't try to subvert my expectations because it being good is one of those. Surpass my expectations. That's, well, you know, what it's you like know, right now. I we've want. got all of our rights back, you know, for heavy gear. Nice. So they were out there locked in for 15 years with Sony, you know, because once they had done the TV series, it automatically triggered, you know, like certain amounts of time that they get to keep control the rights for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've got all those rights back and I'm still being contacted from time to time by Hollywood, you know, asking, are they available? I'm saying, really? yes, they are. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like, I just basically, I tell them, yep, uh, they're available. But I'd be the executive producer of the show and I'd have final say on the imagery and the story. And normally that's what the showrunners that these people that contact you are wanting to be they want to be the guy yeah. controlling everything and when you tell them that you know it's like yeah i want to be that guy you know because i know what's best you know like and you know then they lose interest <laughs> yeah i mean it's not it's, like i haven't been with this particular setting living and breathing it for the last 20 or so years you know so yeah it's you look what happened to game of thrones as well yeah, yeah. it's like you you just go it's better to have somebody involved in the project that has some final say and you know again we've learned because of our past experience it wasn't a terrible experience, you know, but just, you know, like that's the way Hollywood, Hollywood is, you know, like yeah. they meaningful consultation means they talk to us about it and they decide to do what they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. On the one hand, I can understand them because nobody likes creating something and having someone else looking over their shoulder the whole time. So it is understandable. It's still just a pain in the ass to watch something you've you know created and you're in charge of get, you know, turn into something completely different. Yeah. No, well, normally yeah. it's whoever's putting the money into a project gets the final say, you know, because money, money talks, you know, yeah. like for everything in Hollywood. Money talks, yeah. bullshit walks. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's, On it's, the plus it's side, a... it did result in the two very good video games. So yeah. there is at least, you know, you can definitely see how, you know, cross media for heavy gear, at least as, you know, it, there is potential there because a good miniature game two good role play game, the fourth edition of which successfully kickstarted. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. But that's yeah. Nick, you know, like Nick's team that he pulled together, you know, like did most of the work there, you know, like I just helped with, you know, working out all the details for the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah. Because I realized, you know, like that uh, the small team that we have here in Montreal, you know, like 
that's basically just three people, you know, doing all the casting, the packaging and all that, you know, mm-hmm. and then outside the office, we've got the, the rules rooster for the, for the heavy gear, you know, blitz game. Yeah. You know, and then Nick has started his little team, you know, down in Arkansas for the, the RPG and realize that if we want to have it happen, you know, I couldn't take it on myself. You know, yeah. I could just oversee things, you know, and say, okay, this is what you've got to get done. And they got all the stuff written. You know, like they came to me and said, look, it's going to be 480 pages long. We need about 300 pieces of artwork, you know, if we're going to replace everything, yeah. you know, like, uh, so I came up with a plan of how we, you know, raise the money to do that. Right now we've got, you know, five artists working, you know, on the artwork for the, the RPG. Mm-hmm. They're delivering, you know, like every week I'm sending out, you know, payments to the different artists as they, as they deliver artwork, you know, so hopefully by the end of August, all the artwork should be done. If it takes an extra month, it takes an extra month. You know, our goal is to try to get it out like in October to people. You know, but really to get it out before Christmas. You know, because we'd love oh, to have be that book time, available. Yeah. You know, in time for Christmas, so people you know, that haven't supported the Kickstarter yet, or now we've got the uh, DreamPod Nine Pledge Manager, where you can be an outside backer. So if you missed the Kickstarter you know, back in April and May, you know that uh, you can get in on the same deal. You know, until we actually close out put the last piece of artwork into the layout you know then it basically has to be you know do a test print you know like uh yeah the last the, thing you want is for something to get printed and then you realize oh crap this doesn't work at all yeah well, and, then, and then at that point it's like okay it's ready to go we can send out the ebook versions to all the backers and then go and contact them and go and say okay the printed book is going to be printed actually at the printer shipped directly to your place you know like all print on demand you know and uh DreamPod 9 doesn't have to deal with, you know, like what happens if, say, from the printer in Tennessee, you know, if the book gets dinged by UPS, you know, like and gets damaged on a corner. Well, you send us a photo, you know, give us all the details, you know, and then we go back to the printer and say, okay, replace that. Yeah. It's on you. It's on you <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> yeah. So going back to, you know, this uh, brings it to mind the changes uh, in the you know RPG and miniatures industry from the '90s to now. You can really you know, like you've been through here throughout all these things. How do you th- really compare? You know, doing this the writing and the designing, layout and shipping and all that stuff from now to back then in the '90s when you were just starting out. Well, back then you it was easier to actually you know make money. I guess you'd say you know with the distributors back then because there's far fewer game companies. You know, like we're talking now, like since, you know, everybody can come up with stuff like get print on demand books before there was no such thing as print on demand. You know, we were doing print jobs with transcontinental Quebec core, you know, like here in Quebec, you know, and all your comic books, you know, like they're that were printed with these two companies, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, up here in Quebec as well. And so no matter what, you basically had to order like 2000 copies of a book. You know, if you, if you, even if you didn't have sales for them, you know, if you, if you said, oh, we're only going to sell 200, still at order 2000, you know, you had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, like, and ourselves back then, the one good thing that's happened with this print on demand option now, because it's not web printing where you have the big rolls of paper going through the machines and getting printed or page by page, you know, now with print on demand, you can actually have color because when we did color in the past, it each didn't work page. Out. Well, no, each page, you had to get color separations done for each page. And those color separations for, for a page were about $120 per page. So you wanted to have 10 pages of color? That's $1,200 just to get the plates made wow. before on top of the regular cost of printing. You know, you wanted to have a big full color book? You might spend, you know, like $100,000 on, on plates and color separations. And that's before you know, the printing even starts. Yeah, and... Then you basically have to print you know, at least twenty thousand to bring the cost down, you know. So it's reasonable. So then at that point, five dollars of each book cost, you know, is those plates, you know, and you're selling it, you know, at the the high value. Whereas now it's print on demand. It's high quality photocopiers, you know, yeah, you know, like that are doing everything. And then, you know, like uh, for us, the the newer books, we have to leave the back page of each book blank so they can add a little barcode. So somebody in the factory or the the printing press down in Tennessee. Or, you know, they've got presses, you know, like in the UK, they've even got some down in Australia now, you know, where somebody takes a cover that's been printed, that's got a barcode on it, takes the interior that's printed, it's got a barcode on it, puts it together with the glue, you know, just does the binding, gets the thing trimmed, you know, like, and 
they can do it one book at a time. Yeah. You know, and like it's send more, it off to whoever ordered it. Yeah. It's more expensive per book, but you know, for the color stuff, you know, like there's, you know, you're not stuck with like what happens if you did, you know, like 20,000 copies and you got a big typo or mistake on page 52. You're going to sell those 20,000 copies because you're not remaking it. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, those, the years before, you know, the, you know, kind of, steam and stuff like that where games would not you need to get a whole other cd with a patch in order to fix like a bug uh game breaking bug that someone got in their game when they bought it yeah there's basically like the whole idea of downloading it's uh straight from the company what has been completely foreign to a lot of people for a very long time it's just like you had to spend all that extra time really making sure everything worked and always there's something that's gonna go wrong especially in pc gaming with everybody having such a def- different you know so- software yeah. and everything and hardware yeah. Go, going back to your, your question you had before about how things actually got get made. So I would basically say, okay, we, we want to have, well, people have been asking online, is there going to be any new machines for the Northern faction, you know, like of Heavy Gear mm-hmm. or of Caprice or you know, of anything? Or when are you guys going to be doing, you know, like uh, the stuff for Eden? You've mentioned stuff like in the old books, you know, when are you going to do the miniatures for them? You know, and yeah. that leads to, okay, we've completed nearly all of North and South. You know, like we can still do some new designs. Like even now, just this month, we brought out the Rock Beetle helicopter, you know, for which was shown way, way back. But, you know, like it's we are going, OK, we've already got the Scorpion. We've got the Dragonfly. You know, like, do we need another VTOL, you know, vertical takeoff and landing yes. helicopter? Always. You know? Oh, yeah. But the cost is prohibitive. You know, like mm-hmm. if you, you've got the 3D modeling cost, if you pay a, a 3D modeler, then you to make the molds, you know, like costs hundreds of dollars before you can make the first dollar of sales. But now that it's 3D printing, you got the 3D modeler and you go to 3D printer. You skip all that step in between. Mm-hmm. You know, so suddenly it becomes feasible to do that. You know, like uh, so we've we've done that, you know, like and we're working on a whole bunch of other new designs. So nice. uh, and even some things, you know, like that uh, like Eden got done with all new releases, you know, like where we put we timed that to work out with the 3.1 version of the rules for, for heavy gear blitz, you know, and right now we've got the same team, you know, like of the rooster, you know, with Nick and also our artists, you know, actually Eldon, you know, like, so if you've seen Eldon's work, you know, like he's the, the one, he's also one of the main artists for, for Faz or sorry. Yeah. He's done a lot of work for Battletech. Yeah. 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 So we've got Eldonius Rex on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, he's a great artist Mm -hmm. and we basically work with him, you know, and, Tell them, okay, we want to do something like this, you know, like that would be looking sort of like this design, you know, like, but bigger with a big bazooka or something like that. Yeah. You know, and let him have fun. He'll come back with a sketch and we'll go and say, oh, that looks good. You know, and you just work back and forth. So, because all of us have our own appeals, you know, like that I'll, I'll like square blocky designs, you know, or, you know, rounded designs like Japanese animation sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But other people like different designs. So that's why it's better to have more people looking at it and going, well, that's too much like the designs you've had before. Why would somebody buy that? They'd still, they'd play North if they're going to play square blocky. You know, like how do we make that more, you know, the, a new look that somebody would want to pick up that style of robot. Yeah. While still matching the existing style of the particular faction of which it belongs to. Yep. And then, you know, like some new stuff, you know, like, uh, on the horizon, you know, we're, we're the next thing we're working on is New Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's you know in the works. Yeah, you know, but we've got all this stuff, you know, like in between there, you know, like where we've shown a lot of things in the latest companion, you know, where um, we've had uh, one of our three D models over in Japan, Taro, that's basically been working on new infantry for the faction. So there's going to be infantry, you know, like for Eden, for Caprice. There's even going to be the Pullum. Uh, armor you know like that we've talked about for peace river in the past you know yeah you know, kind of so, like a powered exoskeleton uh, type yep. armor something so, to give them a bit like an edge against the grells and other uh, cef super soldiers yep it's uh, all all the stuff you know like so we have these ideas and then we go and say okay taro have fun with it you know you know like and because it's always better to let your artists or 3d bottlers to do what they like to do you know, and then go and tweak the models afterwards to go and say, okay, that, that yeah, do more like that, less like this, you know, and make mm-hmm. it so that, you know, because these miniatures are so small, like we're talking, the infantry is only 12 to 14 millimeters tall, you know, so how do you differentiate it? You got to make the heads have different helmets, shoulders look different, you know, because yeah. otherwise they're pretty small. 
and pretty hard to differentiate one from another without a paint job. Yep. You know, so we do that, you know, and by working back and forth, you know, like, and then lots of Skype calls, you know, like, and, or Zoom meetings, you know, yeah. to, to basically share screens where we're looking at a piece and going, this is the design we've got so far. You know, what do you think? You know, and just, we're all looking at it going, okay, it's like, eh, that gun, you know, looks a little bit too weak there, you know, like, or the shoulder, you know, like, uh, needs to have a little bit more spacing between the shoulder and the torso, because it looks like it's more locked in the position that it couldn't move, you know? And it's back and forth with sketches in, in Photoshop, you know, like, or just screen screen grabs, you know, like. Yeah, because uh, something that looks good as an image, you know, in 2D isn't necessarily going to work when you finally put it in 3D as a model. Yeah, well, then it's then it's a whole other beast once it gets into 3D, you know, like when you see more static views where the 3D artist is, maybe has a front and uh, back view of the robot. And sometimes they don't exactly match, you know, like, because, again, it's artwork, you know, it's yeah. like it's, you know. It's, you're not going to have the person you know, doing a 3D model to make the artwork. Then afterwards, we take that, that 2D sketch of front and back, and the 3D modeler has to match it up. Or they have to find out that it's like, hey, the arms that we showed in the artwork, you know, like are a little bit too short to, to grab, grip the gun, you know, like in front of the, the torso. You know, like, so we have to tweak it here and there, you know, like mm -hmm. and make the cones, you know, like a, on, the, on the sides of the torso. A little bit bigger so they can stick out and move them a little bit forward a bit yeah otherwise yeah. the arms would never work yeah because artists do what they want to do and then know, reality, reality is does a... <laughs> no other thing yeah exactly yeah and if you want to maintain that same level of you know versatility we were talking earlier not just in terms of like having the miniatures look you know feasible being you know actually designable in the real yeah. 3d terms but also having it look like if this were a real giant robot, it would actually be able to move properly, and not just trip over itself and break its own cockpit and other yeah. great thing the ground. Well, it's even like once you once you've got the design where you're going, okay, this is what it's going to look like. Then it's breaking it up into pieces, or actually building it in pieces, mm -hmm. so that you have like the, the the shoulder might be made, the upper arm is another piece, the lower arm is another piece, the hand is another piece, and then it's basically positioning it and doing the in between pieces, you know, like of the elbow. You know, to, to make sure it actually all works because yeah. you got to, you know, we, we've had ideas like when we're doing miniatures by hand, we have Philip Leclerc, which is our main sculptor, you know, like for all handmade miniatures, you know, where he's actually taking styrene, slicing it down, sanding it using putty. And, you know, he would make amazing poses, you know, like, because he'd mm -hmm. make it more dramatic, you know, like, and then you go, oh, Phil, that's a great kneeling pose. Let's let's is this gonna work, you know, like in the mold? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like the when undercuts we mold there. This, is this actually gonna work or how do we gonna open it then and pour in the stuff we need to get make the actual oh, yeah. miniature? Well we, we well we made the mold, you know, like and then found out, yeah, and let's see the mold tore out at that area where the, the knee is like you know, too tight, you know, like and like the, the, the back of the foot is there grabbing the, the the vulcanized rubber and it tore out after two spins. Mm. And you're going, okay, well, so yeah, we got four or five six good pieces, you know, and then, you know, okay, we can't do that. Let's break the legs in two, you know, and when it's a 3D model, it's a little bit easier to break it in two where, where when it's a, a piece that was already all glued together, Phil literally had to go and rebuild it from all the parts again and yeah. you know, make it into two parts you know, that would be in the mold. So sometimes you'll see some of our older stuff that did work as, you know, as a solid pose of kneeling for the hunters and Jaegers. And then a lot of times you go, how come you guys have, don't have any kneeling poses for anything else? Well, that's because it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. But now with 3D printing, you don't have to worry about it. So we're going to be looking at doing some of those poses in the future again. Yeah, nice. Because you know you just have to scrape up the little spruing that's inside these little hair like hair like filaments that join the parts together. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, you can have amazing looking details on all the surfaces now. Yeah, I'm looking here at uh, the uh, DP9 store. You guys uh, also sell some, uh, I'm looking at just a few of them, but uh, actual, you know, like scale models as well of some of your stuff. I'm seeing so, some Jovian Chronicles. and the, Yeah, those were done by Alan, you know, with his, his company Fusion Models. So he's the one that actually makes the 135th scale Kodiak. And he's actually done a detailed cockpit kit where you can put it inside. So we sell the Master Grade with everything now. You get the Hammer Strike anti-gear missile launcher on the back. You get nice. the cockpit that you can either... You can have it opened up where you see a little pilot sitting inside, you know, and all the details for it. Yeah. Yeah. The, 
But that's all done garage yeah. kit style. You don't like the Yeah, the Kodiak's a bit rich for my blood, unfortunately. But the Pathfinder and the Serene there are yeah, I think they're fairly affordable. I might want to go. Yeah, there's only like that for Christmas. One two hundred scale, you know. So yeah. I mean you know, that uh Wanzer I have up here uh, needs some company. <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 Kodiak, you know, like it's it was done, you know, like we sold quite a few of those, you know, like back in the day mm-hmm. because people wanted that was the, the main thing. You wanted a one thirty fifth scale, and there's a lot of one thirty fifth scale like uh, World War II vehicles as well. Oh yeah, you know, like so people can have that, you know, like Kodiak beside a Panzer tank if they want, you know, just yeah. to show how big it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's always good to have something you can do for you know size comparisons for these things just to show off the scale. But bring up World War Two. You know, we've talked about heavy gear a bit. We talked about Wrench and Jovian Chronicles. There's obviously other uh, settings that have also been created uh, for for the uh, silhouette system for uh, the end. You know, yeah. Well, that, that led to a team uh, out in Toronto. Yeah, that they and basically gear said they like, Gear Creek. They basically took some of the gears. They took a Kodiak, you know, and they started instead of having the V engine on the back, they basically put a rotary, you know, like an airplane, a rotary engine on the back of it. You know, and started doing like games of you know World War II, you know, like where you had you know Shermans and Panzers and all that, and the gears on on the table, and mm-hmm. you know did some games, you know, like at different conventions, and approached us with the idea, and we said, oh, yeah, let's go and make it a a world, you know, like weird weird a weird War II type setting, you know, like where you know like they're they're not going to have really Sherman tanks, but you'd have a Sherman tank with a Tesla turret on it, you know? yeah, yeah, it's you, an alternate history kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. Like every, In this case, everything. one where the Germans got around the uh, <laughs> arms restrictions post World War One by saying, "Oh no, no, we are not making tanks. We are making walking vehicles. There is nothing in the treaty that says we cannot build walking vehicles. Also, we are taking France." Yeah, <laughs> which because, they did. <laughs> yeah, and the Maginot Line is made up of Tesla uh, Tesla cannons. Yeah. So basically, I gotta say, if ever you guys, you know. I always wondered if, uh, for a while, I got gotten a bit into Command and Conquer, uh, you know, Red Alert and stuff like that, the way back, and recently gotten back into that. And I have to admit, I've been looking online to see if somebody decided to make a Command and Conquer RPG. And yeah, I think so. would make a very good system for that. It just required Gear Creek and a couple of tweaks, and you could do yeah. some uh, proper Tim Curry in space uh, action in that. Yeah, well, for us, you know, like, we, we did that, you know, like, way back, you know, and it sold all right at the time, but it's it sort of scavenges our own clientele because it's mm-hmm. still a you know like a miniature war game you know land base you know not unless you played it as Luftkrieg where you're playing you know World War II super aircraft you know like you have P fifty five it's Ascenders you know Gloucester Pioneers and things like that Shindens you know like the flying wings and stuff like that the yeah. Horton but you know like w- you got to concentrate on one thing you know and it's like okay do you put more of your time and your staff on something that, that's your your biggest seller or something that's basically not your biggest seller, you know, mm, and you're, you're problem, trying to pay the it? bills, you know, so you basically do what, what sells the best and what makes you the most money, you know, and uh, everything worked out pretty well until around, you know, 2008, you know, when the recession hit there, mm. you know, like, and then, yeah. uh, you know, we had to downsize back then because we had a couple of distributors went bankrupt and, uh, well, you know, it's like, when when suddenly you're going okay, well there goes forty fifty thousand dollars. You're never gonna get paid, you know. Like you just go okay. Yeah, at that point, yeah, you got to start focusing on what makes you the most money. Yeah, and even like that was when we did the focus for the RPG RPG being put on the back burner, you mm-hmm. know, in favor of uh, heavy gear blitz, you know, for the miniature yeah. game. Because one other thing that was happening at around the same time is ebooks had become a thing. You know, like, uh, yeah. so we had all of our books being converted. They were just, first, they were just scanned versions of the of the old books, you know, with the, the cover sliced off and scanned and made a, a scanned version of the ebook. But, you know, like, uh, it was also the start of torrenting and all that, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, you're going, how come we're not making a lot of money on these books anymore? It's like, oh, people are downloading them elsewhere. It's like, oh, look, there's a torrent with all of our books, you know, like, and it's being downloaded 6,000 times, you know, and uh, we made no money. <laughs> It's like off of them. but you couldn't at that yeah. point, you know, like you know, like make copies of the miniatures any anywhere easy, you know. And even now you gotta have the three D files. Exactly. And you've got to have the skill, you know, like to be able to print them because it's it's not the Star Trek replicator type technology, the three D printer. You still gotta have some skill to know how you position the parts, 
the speed that you use the machine at, you know, like how you clean, how soon you take the parts out of the, uh, like when they're done to be cleaned with an alcohol solution, then UV cured, you know, it's, you know, it's got a formula, you know, like. Yeah, which, and there's, you know, a price to entry as well. It's not as expensive as it was back then when it first yeah. started coming out, but, you know, you still have to have the money up front if you're going to actually do any of this stuff. Yeah, and it's it's still, it's not a clean thing, you know, like resin, you got to wear like silicon, you know, like gloves, you know, like, uh, or latex gloves when you're working with it because it's very sticky. Yeah. You know, like if you have, if you got a cat, uh, make sure it doesn't go anywhere near the resin, you know, because yeah, you'll be shaving three, fluffy or down. Or three dogs like I've got. Yeah. Yeah. You you don't want dog hair in the resin. No, 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 no. We have dog hair everywhere. There is no way of escaping that. We vacuum. We send the Roomba to do its due diligence. But unfortunately, it's just not enough. Yeah. So it's 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 not like where you just snap your fingers, you know, and even when you when it's working well, you know, you're going, how long did it take to print that little robot? You know, like, well, that was three hours. You know, like, although if you've got the new machines where you're able to, like, you're actually flashing the light underneath with the new UV curing, you know? So you could have 10 robots done in the same time as one because they're all, mm. the entire plate is filled with a robot. You know, so you can actually do productions now. Whereas before it used to be one thing or you basically screwed it all out there and it was actually printing all the stuff, like actually laying down the parts, like the earlier versions of stuff actually had you know, like the just like these uh, the printers you see now for the FDM, where you actually got a filament where it's actually going everywhere. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and it used to be that the light was hitting this area, then moving to the area and, and so forth. Yeah? yeah, and now it's all happening in one shot. Boom! You know, like the entire plate is done. You well, know, raise it up the... by point one millimeter or whatever. Yeah, you know? you know, boom! You know, take another shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely one uh, point for efficiency right there. Plus, you also have to worry about like the apply uh, the whatever the material you're using the feed. Make sure nothing's getting clogged or and everything's working yeah. out there too. Well, you got to keep an eye on it. You just can't walk away from it. You know, it's yeah. like uh, you know, like even Alain when he's been playing with it. You know, like uh, for his, doing tests. You know, it's like comes back after an hour. Oh, something happened. It <laughs> shifted. You know, and everything's crooked there. You know? so yeah. So he doesn't know. You know, like did somebody jar the table that it was on or whatever? You know? Was there you an know? errant breeze? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. It's Some like, butterfly in Indonesia decided to flap its wings and all of a sudden you need to reprint another robot. Yep. <laughs> you, you just don't know. The only thing that's going for it is when you're doing it all yourself, you know, you basically, oh, the left arm didn't come out. Well, let's just make, you know, like on all these builds here, let's just make a plate of left arms and print off, you know, like 50 left arms, you know, like and go back to the kit that had all the defects, you know, and go, okay, remove that, 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 that. Add one, one left arm, one left arm. One. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys also provide uh, miniatures that are already pre-built, or is they all like in uh, different kits they have to put together? It's mostly all you know, like uh, in parts, mm -hmm. because the the way that we've done things is we try to treat them like little model kits. So you'll actually have normally the legs are one piece or two pieces that get glued together. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have a rounded hub, you know, like on the on the top of the hips, and then underneath the torso, you'd have like a a socket, a cup. So then you can actually have the torso twisting the way that you want. You glue it, you know, left, right, angled up or down. You would have the arms. Normally they're one piece, you know, like the shoulder, upper arm, and lower arm with with hand. But they'd have like a little socket in them, and you'd have a little cone on the side of the torso, so you could basically position them. In some of our stuff that we did for um, the heavy gear plastics, you know, like in this for Utopia or not Utopia for uh, Peace River and New and New Coal. We actually came up with a cool idea where you have the upper arm and shoulder has a hollowed area in the in the part of the arm where mm -hmm. you can take the lower arm and above its elbow and has a peg. So you could actually peg it in there and then twist the lower part of the arm into the angle you want. Nice. You know, like, uh, but that was the plastics. You know, like it's kind of hard to do that with metal, mm -hmm. you know, for simple fact that if the mold tears out to try to gouge out, you know, or, you know, say with a Dremel to try to drill out that channel would be way too time consuming yeah yeah and this but, allows you to create use like okay i have this model it comes with this variety of weapons i want this particular variant so i'm going to glue on this particular gun add this particular rocket pack and now i have yep. this particular gear versus one that with the different uh and, different and we try we try to have sometimes like different leg poses like slightly more wide or a running pose and we'll try to have also like always a uh, a standard you know arms pose which 
and one that would actually have, you know, like the left or right hand cupped to hold the gun across the torso mm -hmm. area. You know, and things that we didn't have, like, say, for the first Kickstarter we did for North South, you know, they just had this, the one pose of arms, you know. Mm -hmm. So we actually made some resin parts based on the, the, the plastic injection kits, you know, that had the thing to cup the hand. And people could buy those, you know, like to, from our online store to actually have the option of having the gun across the chest, you know, for the plastics because it, it didn't work too well. Same thing right now, one of the... The releases we just put out the, this month, you know, is the Caprice leg sets as 3D printed models, you know, so you actually have five Caprice legs, either the small type for the Bashan and, and Apex mounts, or the larger armored legs that are used for the Migidu, the Kadesh, and the Amon, you know, and Tony, who's our 3D modeler for those, you know, like he basically said, oh, I could make little cylinders, you know, like in the underside of the hips. And allow the legs to be positioned a little bit better because before we just had pegs, so they slotted in, you know, and it was like they were always, you know, like at the the cardinal point. So four legs, they're pointing one north, one south, one east, one west, yeah, yeah, so forth, yeah. Now they actually have a cylinder on them where you can basically put the little cap underneath that holds the four legs in to yeah. the hip part, and then you can rotate the legs a little bit to the front or the back in each one. Yeah, and, and it, put them in different poses. Like I'm looking here. Standard pose, crouching pose, attack pose, where yeah. one leg uh, with one leg with a machine gun or something on it pointed upward. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, we we've given like slightly different instead of just all the standard leg that we've given before. We've given somewhere it's bent a little bit more at the top where it connects to the hips to be a crouching pose, or it's a little bit taller so it basically is raising up. Mm -hmm. So when you take the the standard leg, the crouching leg, the tall leg, or the attacking leg, you can mix them up. And basically make the different poses. So if you basically take two tall legs in the back and two crouching legs in the front, you get a crouching forward pose. You know, like if you took yeah. well, two you'll crouching, see you can have like the the amount of display position in such a way that it looks like it's in mid stride or you know going at a run. Not not really that much yet because we don't allow you to bend the legs at the uh, at the knees yet. Yeah, yeah. that's something because it just adds more and more parts. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, some people might like that. But the average player is going, okay, it's going to take me forever to glue, glue this together. <laughs> yeah. Well, the fact that they are assemblable is definitely going to turn up uh, some people who prefer just like, you know, straight out of the box and get to playing right away kind of thing. Yeah. Well, well as you look at the way things are made, like the one thing we did decide when we started the company is, you know, we're basically going to get stuff made in North America, mm -hmm. not in China. You know, like, although when we did the plastic injection molds, we had to go over to China. You know, the first time we were, we get molds made in Shenzhen, you know, and the second time, you know, we actually used, you know, like the, the more democratic side of China. We went to Taiwan and got the molds made there because <laughs> just one plastic injection mold, you know, like for these robots, you know, $15,000 US. You know, wow. you want to get the same mold made in Canada or the United States, it's $55,000. <laughs> yeah, me and the wife, uh, me and the missus have our own little business here. Trying to find local, uh, you know, uh, printers and stuff like that for our stuff is, God, it's so difficult because, you know, A, they want massive kind of shipment orders and two, the prices that are required for them here compared to overseas are just like astronomical yeah. in terms of differences. It's, it's pretty amazing what and things And they wonder cost. why people, you know, do all their printing in China, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's amazing what's happened, like, because of the pandemic, yeah? Mm -hmm. you know, before the pandemic, when we were doing, like, those things, even when it was Taiwan, the last batch, the cost of shipping like these molds back from China in a container, you know, it was mm -hmm. about $2,000 to get them shipped oh, yeah. back from oh, yeah. China. Oh, yeah, familiar. Like, yeah. But, you know, like, you know, at the end of the pandemic, you know, like where all the supply chain broke down, you know, the cost of shipping those containers had hit $25,000 for one container. You know, like, because they, they, all the stuff was sitting over in the States when they had, you know, not getting loaded back to China. Yeah. But now I, I, I get stuff like all these shipping companies I've been in contact with, you know how much it costs to get a container, you know, next month, you know, like from China to Long Beach? How much? 1200 Still pretty much, uh, still well, pretty heavy uh, That's amount. That's cheap. You know, like yeah. considering that it was, you know, two years ago or a year and a half ago, 25000 And then what that shows you is the economy in China, you know, everything's going down right now. You know, it's like, it's, you know, we're, we're we, we are, are in a recession, even though, for some reason, prices continue going up. You know, like the all of the there are the shenanigans afoot. Yep. <laughs>
but never you know, like, underestimate. But the you can't you can't fake the shipping costs. You know, like if, if yeah. they're charging that, you know, it's you know, like it's they're gonna get what what the going rate is. You know, and that mm -hmm. means that there's a lot of empty container ships. <laughs> you know, yeah, right now. <laughs> I mean, fuel costs with fuel costs. There's no getting around that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So uh, we've we've done everything you know in Canada and the United States. You know, like uh, like our plastic injection molds. You know, that we did have made in Taiwan. We had them shipped over here, and they're sitting in Ville Saint Laurent. You know, like here in Montreal at a company called Plasti World, and they pop all of our plastics for New Coal, Peace River, and Utopia. Whereas the first batch of, of plastic mo injection molds we got done with for North South. Uh, Caprice and the CEF, the, the Earth Forces. Mm -hmm. You know, we had those shipped to Lebanon, Indiana, to a, a company called Models LLC. You know, which does plastic injection molding down there, and we're able to mark on those. You know, like plastics made in the USA. You know, so they sell pretty well in the yeah. United States. Less yeah. lead in the plastic, hopefully. Oh yeah, it's, but <laughs> oh, the, these guys, you know, like their their main business is doing models like what we do, the little toys. Mm, they're perfect. they're defense contractors. You know, it's like. They're doing parts for Raytheon, you know, General Dynamics. Nice. You know, like, and, you know, that's what they make their money on, you know. And, uh, but, yeah, you, you never know who you meet. Like, right now, we're talking, you know. Yeah. I might know somebody you need to get contact with, you know, like, one of my friends down in Indianapolis, you know, knew the, the owner of this company and said, they'd say, hey, can you do little giant robots? You know, and guys are, yeah, it's like can. little giant robots. How little are the giant robots? It's like, yeah, it's like they're, they're 28 millimeter, 30 millimeter tall. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> uh. you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a control thing as well. Like when you have stuff done down there, you know, like you basically have to tell them, okay, use this type of plastic, you know, mm, do, yeah. do these sort of things. If we get defects, you know, like uh, we expect them to be replaced on the next shipment, so, so forth. Yeah. Yeah. We do the same thing with our stuff. Whereas the stuff that's done here in Montreal, you know, like I just went over to the, to the company, you know, when they were running the, the molds, you know, and did sporadic checks and going, okay, look, there's a problem here. You know, like, uh, you know, check all of these there, you know, for the, that, that detail didn't come out, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, it's too bad. There's a hundred pops, you know, like grind them up, you know, put them back in the machine to be remelted, you know, it's like, and start it again. <laughs> well, I mean, that's an advantage of, you know, working in these kinds of materials. You can actually do that. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 learning though you know it's like because we did uh we we're learning each each different phase of doing this so it's like first we learned how to do plat you know like pewter casting you know yeah you know then it was like how do we make the molds you know so i actually know how to cut the vulcanized rubber molds you know and you, know, you learn the next phase for resin casting we had everything being done at the office at one point you know and alain you know it's just so much better quality that you know like we'd always get about 10% defect, which would, we ended up having bins full of, of defective resin because we weren't putting anything with, with bubbles in it, you know, like selling it to the customer. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Whereas Alain, he maybe gets, you know, like half a percent defect rate. He just knows how to, to do resin casting because he's, he's been doing it for so long. Yeah. If you're going to have like your main source of income be the miniatures, you have to have a certain level of standard yep. in order to justify what you're charging for them. Yep, and and now with the with the three D printing, you know, it's just like oh, you just got to check the parts as best as you can, <laughs> you know. And if you catch something, it's like okay, fix it. And if there's a problem later on, this is one thing that we, you know, you know, me as a, the owner of the company, I said, you know, it's like hey, I don't want to basically have people going and saying it's like oh, there's a problem with the miniature and they don't fix it. Well, I just go and say, well, you know, just tell us what the problem, show us what it is. You know, it's like you yeah. need it, you need it replaced. You know, we'll get it mailed out. You know, like in a small padded envelope or in, included with your next order. You know, it's because yeah, it's the last better for me to want, keep the customer yeah. happy. Exactly. The last thing you want is, you know, bad Google reviews that are telling people don't buy from these people. They don't uh, fix their stuff when something goes wrong. Yeah. You know, so it's like if we if we if we know about a problem, we fix it. You know, like if somebody never never doesn't tell us about something, you know, like that. Oh, this is the hand got miscast. And it's like, which, which hand? You know, it's like and then we go and check the mold. And go, oh, damn. The air vent, you know, like that was supposed to let the air out of that tip of the part. You know, must have got blocked up at one point. You know. And didn't allow the air out, so the the metal didn't fill in, or maybe uh -huh. it filled in the first, you know, like thirty or forty times, and on the fiftieth spin, you know, like it basically left a bubble. You know, yeah, and we didn't spot it, yeah, you know, because it's such a small thing, you know. But it's like we can fix it, you know. It's like it's it's not that hard, you know. It's it's you know. It's just a question plastic of being, plastic yeah. injection molds you can't fix, you know, because yeah. you want it. But it's you, just really a question of knowing that the problem is there, so you can fix it, because otherwise yeah. it just escapes notice. 
And as, as we move forward, you know, with the bringing back the uh, RPG that, you know, by this fall, we'll have the fourth edition out, you know, mm-hmm. at that point, there's going to be two product lines, you know, like there's going to be the Heavy Gear Blitz for the miniature game and Heavy Gear RPG. And the newer books that come out after that are going to be, you know, have about four sections in the book. So part of it's going to move forward the storyline, you know, and then from that storyline and the new, what we call the field guide. So that we used to call the, the tech readouts and stuff like that, that people are used to seeing, you know, or you know, our vehicle compendiums, mm-hmm. you know, we call them field guides back at the start. So we're bringing back that, that terminology. And we'll actually have a terminology, the, the field guide section, introducing these newer robots and new designs, but not just to use for the RPG, but it'll actually be one book that is used by Blitz and the RPG. Nice. Yeah. You know, so basically you'll get all that and you'll have elements, you know, like of how you use the new story, you know, and vehicles, you know, for RPG scenarios or for Blitz scenarios. That is something I've always liked about DreamPod 9's games is that they are as much war games as they are role-playing games. There's less of a distinction between the two, which has built up over the years since, you know, D&D, which started out as basically fantasy war gaming for, you know, the particular part of Wisconsin Gary Gygus was in. And as gradually you've seen that split between them where <clears throat> certain games just go full on, just full narrative and low low ruled count and other ones go far far more stay far closer to that original how should i put this that original kind of like source of yeah. where these games came from yeah and which i tend to prefer frankly i mean i'm yeah I've well, played so things the, ha- yeah things have to basically be uh, have to evolve you know because if we if we kept everything the way <clears throat> heavy gear was at the start one robot took an entire page you know, a stat for it, you know, like, and you had, you marked off, like when you're playing the tactical version of the game, you marked off every round of ammunition you used, you know, like, and like a hunter used to be 380 threat value, you know, mm-hmm. and you counted, it, you had regular ammunition, it counted that. If you had the armor piercing rounds, it counted more, you know, like if you did a, a burst, you marked off 10 rounds of ammunition, you had 60 rounds to start off with, you know, like, and so mm-hmm. many clips, you know, and yeah. It just add if you're doing an RPG, fine. People love that sort of information. But if you're doing a miniature war game, it's like it bogs log it bogs down the game where you're just waiting and trying to mark off everything, you know. And as yeah, you, as you I get, have to, I have to make a confession. I'm exactly the kind of guy who will have not only myself but anybody who plays with me marking down each individual round of ammunition they're using. <laughs> like I yeah. actually run with full encumbrance rules, whatever I'm playing. <laughs> Oh yeah, but it, it just bog, bogs, it bogs it down now, you know, because you got Games Workshop with now it's what tenth edition, you know, like uh, and every time they simplify it down even more, yeah, you know? mm. yeah, and maybe they'll just go and say, oh, it's like uh, to make more money, we'll go and say that this Space Marine now, you know, like kills all the other guys all the time, yeah, you know? but he flip costs fifty dollars for one guy, <laughs> yeah, it's like flip a coin. If tails kills this guy, if the heads kills you, yeah, but what we did for. The, the development, like to get it down where it's easy to add stuff up. We, we started off, you know, with a hunter and said, okay, well, let's go and divide by, you know, 10, you know, so if it was 300, so say it was four, 400 divide by 10, 40. Eventually we decided let's even go down further. So it becomes like four, you know, threat value and then go and say, okay, what's the key elements when we did blitz, you know, to go and mm-hmm. say, okay, well, if it has more armor, it's going to have a higher point value. So this is, this is the baseline. We ended up with a hunter being around five or six threat value points in the game, co- coalescing it all down in, you know, and you'll end up having like the big overlord class hover tank for the earth forces. That's 70 threat value by itself. So you can actually have, you know, like 12 hunters versus one hover, big hover tank. And it'll be a fair fight. Yeah. You know, but if, if you try to you know, count every round of ammunition, you're firing, you know, like the game would take, you know, like all afternoon, you'd be playing like for just these little battles you know, like four or five hours, which is the way it used to be. Now we can actually do, you know, when, when you know the miniature rules, you know, and you've read everything mm-hmm. and, you know, you can play 18 miniatures against 18 miniatures in under two hours because and stuff sports. dies a lot faster. Yeah. You know, yeah. But you still have all the strategy. If you charge <laughs> out into the center and don't use the cover, you're going to die. You know, Good. it's like, <laughs> it's, it's you, the, the guys that do the best in the game are, you know, U.S. military, Canadian military forces, you know, because they realize it's like, ah, you know, you don't use a strategy of having all your guys grouped together, you know, like uh, 
goes, hey, what are those rockets you got there? Hey, what's special with them? Oh, they've got area effect. <laughs> what's this thing called? Artillery. Oh. Yeah. It's like, oh, everything's grouped together. Well, yeah, you're going to have a couple of guys die. <laughs> yeah, and that's without bringing artillery into the picture, of course. Oh, we, we, we didn't bring that in, into the game at all. You know, like we've said, okay, that's too, too extreme. You know, we've got airstrikes where you'll have like little airstrike counters that you could buy on. You know, that's sort of like a filler for the game. You know, so when you're building your army, you might have 100 threat value against 100 threat value. And maybe you have two or three threat value left over, which is not enough to buy a full gear, you know, like size mm -hmm. unit, but, you know, or even use as, as infantry. So you go, oh, I'll, I'll just buy an airstrike or two, you know, like that can come in during the, the game, you know, from off the table. And, you know, it can still be shot down too because you have gears with weapons, with anti air, air weapons. Yeah. yeah <laughs> if you've got a couple of gears uh, in the back, support gears in the back with uh, sand launchers. Yeah. And all the, all the weapons now, you have ranges that make sense compared to before. A lot of the ranges were the same, where in the old, Folder version of the rules, the uh, rifles and the auto cannons had the same range and just different weapon damages. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. they actually have the rifle shoots quite a bit further than the auto cannon. You know, so if you bring into the table all auto cannons and you're a forest, but and the other guy's got a couple of rifles, he's gonna snipe you uh, from a distance. Yeah. You know, while yeah, you're running the up auto cannons are smooth bore. Yeah. You know, they're designed to pump out more bullets. Yeah. They're, exactly. they're like the original weapons that people had on most of the gears were auto cannons. Because <clears throat> I mean, those, you know, those are classics. You know, when you get down to it, like, I think a, even you know, a BattleTech, the main weapons are auto cannons too. I don't think, I don't think even to this day they have like rifle proper rifled. Uh, I think well, maybe they do in the uh, fluff, but I don't think it's actually encompassed in the actual rules for that game. <clears throat> no, they. They, they, you know, like they've gone back, you know, to the classic battle tech. You know, there's the Alpha Strike, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, every, in many every, ways, but Heavy Gear Blitz is comparable, I guess, to Alpha Strike in terms of yeah. like reducing the complexity and allowing for quicker games with yeah. more. The, the only thing is, <clears throat> they brought out Alpha Strike after they saw <laughs> our stuff. <laughs> there you go. You know, so they, because remember, it went, you know, there's classic battle tech, then it sort of went, you know, like the Whiz Kids version. Mm, yeah, you know, click, uh... clicker stuff, you know, you know, like, and that was great for, you know, if you didn't have any skill at painting, you know, it's like just, you know, mm. you know keep on buying boxes of, of little miniatures and hoping you got the color scheme you wanted. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, God forbid that somebody would just repaint over top of it to make it the rare model. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, who would do a thing like that? <laughs> but yeah, it's like it. Yeah, hey, I, I was at uh, Depticon, you know, in April when they they were launching the latest Kickstarter for the mercenaries. You know, it's like mm -hmm. they they did very well. You know, if you ever get a chance to go down to Depticon, it's well worth a trip. You know? Yeah, I've never been. Yeah, you know, it's it's for it's the 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 Gen Con, you know, for miniature gaming, basically. You know? Yeah, yeah, you know? and uh, nobody got shot. You know, it's like even <laughs> it, was, it was in the the northwest corner of Chicago. You know, so it's the south side of Chicago. You got to worry about. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the miniatures friendly part. Yeah, you know, for ourselves, like since we've been getting back into the, the gaming side and going back to the conventions since the pandemic, we we've gone to Adepticon. You know, last month we were at uh, you know, Can Games in Ottawa. You know, this coming month, you know, like of July, we'll be down in the at Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for Historic Con. Nice. You know, so it's mostly historical gamers there, you know, since they're like forty minutes drive away from Gettysburg and all the oh, historical there you sites. Go, yeah, you know, but you know, reenactment like have, central. You know, we'll we'll be there, you know, like the guys from Flames of War will be there, you know, and a few others, you know, you mm -hmm. know to, to show some little sci-fi elements or, you know, World War II stuff, you know? yeah. And uh, then and we'll there's be... There's going to be a couple of Gear Creek fans down there, too. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also uh, next month, or sorry, in August, we'll be at uh, at Otakathon, Otakathon here in Montreal, you know? Mm -hmm. Since that's really grown, you know, like when we went back to that last year after the pandemic, they had 29,000 people attend Otakathon. That's amazing. You know, we're talking. Well, you know, manga and anime has really you know, had a resurgence ever since the yeah. pandemic. People stuck at home, so they're you know looking at their libraries and stuff to do stuff to do. But you know, I mean, there's it's been reported quite a bit that you know things like manga and BD have really surpassed you know the more conventional uh, mainstream comic books in uh, North America these days. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, it's, it's better quality. <laughs> it's yeah. like you know, and these days the cost of comic books is going up and up for the because the printing cost keeps on going up and up. Where you're going, it's like okay. If, you know, does a story really warrant paying ten dollars for a comic book anymore? You know, it's like, uh, you know, that's not printing really. cost now. You know, it's, yeah, 
Not to mention there's a greater variety in terms of uh, bande dessinée and in terms of manga, in terms of what you can, if you want to read something particular. Like if there's, if there's a niche you want filled, there's a com- uh, bande dessinée or manga that can do it for you. Yep. Oh, yeah. So we, you know, I remember back in the day, you know, it's like back in the 70s and 80s, you know, you had like that Japanese animation showing here on French channels, you know, like you had uh, Al Batal, which is Captain yeah. Harlock, you know. Or Gulderak, which was Grandizer, you know, like uh, so. It's like all Man, this, we I, had that had stuff way before Robotech albums. came along, you know. With I had with some my... original albums of a uh, you know comic book uh, for El Batal back when I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's like we we were special here because we got the stuff from Europe, you know. Exactly, you know, yeah. like and uh, you know, like you know, because hey, I'd rather watch Gulderak, you know, like any day than Grandizer, the the bastardized version that the Americans got, you know. <laughs> you know, when it was translated, you know, yeah. you just go, wow. I like what they did with Macross and everything and stuck a bunch of the animes together to make Robotech. And somehow yeah. it, it worked enough that it got its own sequel, which is yeah. just amazing in many ways. Well, they had to pay for it themselves and they didn't have enough money to, to go any further than that, you know? Yeah. It's like it got one episode, the Sentinels or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but uh, there's... Crazy. Yeah. You know, somehow it's still keeping that name, you know, like even though the licensing deal ended, but somehow Harmony Gold got a new deal signed, you know, with the Japanese company, you know, like... Uh, well, they're good at that. You know, like, uh, I would have rather have seen, you know, like, the original, all the original Macross series, you know, like, uh, as they were, you know, because they hold out way, they hold out a lot better, you know, for the storyline than Robotech ever did, you know? Admittedly, when you take three completely different animes in three completely different universes and smash them together into one single one, you're going to get some dis- uh, some discontinuities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I yeah, mean, speaking like... of continuity, actually, one of the things that uh, DreamPod 9's RPGs are known for, all of them, really, I think, well, specifically uh, Heavy Gear, Jovian Chronicles, and uh, Tribe 8, which is another one we haven't mentioned yet, is continuity there's a great deal of, like heavy gear and, and uh, joven chronicles in particular but especially heavy gear are known for being really good use of meta plot from a time you know in the 90s where meta plot in rpg was you know fairly prominent it was very much the style uh, to do things that way but you guys actually did very well for the most part how do you go about making sure that you have a story in mind how do you make sure that you create enough blank spaces for a game master to actually weave their own tales and adventures and scenarios into that while still making sure things kind of make sense over time. Yeah, we had a really great staff, like at the start, you know, mm-hmm. with Jam, Mark Alex, you know, even the Hillary, Dodo, when she was there, you know, overseeing the story elements, you know, and saying, okay, well, this is the overarching story. You know, like, what do we, what do we allow to be shown here? And then we also created what we called these uh, chess piece systems for the RPG you know, for heavy gear, where we said, okay, you can interact with these persons, they're pawns, you can kill them off, you know, but, you know, this guy's a rook or, you know, like a, a castle type thing, you can meet with them, they're historical figures, you can't kill them in the storyline, you know, like, even if your players want to kill them, no, they can't, <laughs> you know, because they're going to be there later on as key players, you know, mm-hmm. and that allowed us to basically say, okay, well, if these guys are going to show up in different parts of the books, you know, like, uh, even right now, you're, you're seeing, like, uh, the cover of the new RPG has Miranda coming back as part of the Black Talon team. Yeah, yeah. You know, where she was, yeah, she was in Miranda the first Petite. adventure. Yeah, Jungle Drums. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, so we've kept her there. Yeah, she's a bit older. Yeah, you know, like, and uh, her 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 spitting cobra has now become a dark cobra. You know, like uh, with the Black Talon team. Yeah, got a bit of an upgrade. Yeah, well, it's it's just trying to keep you know like. You know, I don't. I was never taking care of that sort of stuff. You know, like we had other people taking care of it. And now we've got some talented, you know, outside t- talent. You know, like uh, fans that are helping us keep track of that because I can't keep track of all that in my head. If what was that guy going to be doing? I know the overarching story of what's happening. You know, of you know what happens. You know, like with Caprice, what happens with New Jerusalem, what happens. You know, like when we eventually get back into the solar system. You know, for Mars. You know, the Earth. You know, like. Uh, you know, who are the bad guys on the, you know, like on Earth? You know, why did they come back? You know, like uh, and attack the Terra Nova and all the other Earth colonies after the crisis that happened 400 years in the past. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What the, do uh, they want? What uh, do they hope to gain from all this? Yeah. Well, it's it's obvious that the one thing we have done maintained canon in all of our stories to start. We said, look, we're never going to have aliens. 
Yeah, there's going to be alien critters. You know, and the scientists get the like when they got the planet Terra Nova. You know, like they looked at the critters and they went. You know, it's like, oh, that's that's cute. Yeah, and, and then, then he it's got an excerpt from the, it, and yeah, his well, name is now slang for doing something stupid. Yeah, it's <laughs> because we we looked at it and said, let's imagine the Star Trek universe where they go to a planet. You know, and somebody goes, oh, that's a cute grizzly bear here, here, kitty, 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 or whatever. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> and two stupid things die. You know, but you know, it's mm. like oh. All this stuff, you know, like, you just have to make it make sense, you know, because yeah. we're never going to have aliens, you know, in our storylines, you know, and we believe that hum humans, you know, we're not nice to one another. <laughs> you know, it's like we Especially can see right not now in a war game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the definition, there's... any kind of setting that is involves miniature war games is not going to be the most peaceful one for purely commercial reasons, yeah. if not narrative ones. So, so unless there's something to drive us together to unite, which would be an alien menace, mm -hmm. which we decided we're never going to have in the game, you know, you know, we will still be fighting one another to the end of time because we're never going to have that Star Trek universe. You know, like we're all going to be friends. You know, it's like, nah. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah, whether it's Sega versus uh, CEGA versus the Jovians or everybody on Terra Nova versus the CEF and all the colonies they've subjugated, it's like, yeah, people are going to shoot each other. Yep. They keep giving right. each other reasons, so yeah, it's like, hey, right now there's a war happening in Ukraine, you know. It's like, and we're basically looking at the stuff and going, oh, so what do you want to eat tonight? You know, it's like because it doesn't affect us, you know, like directly. Yeah, you know, it's like it's sad, you know, like, but that's the way it is, you know, unfortunately, you know, like, so we figured it's going to be that way all the yeah. way to the end of time. You know, I mean, those are, that's just the war we know about. There are probably brush wars and you know border disputes happening all over the, in other parts of the world we just don't know about. Yeah. Well, just doesn't make for sure, you know, news. like the Americans have what over a hundred bases around the world now. You know, it's like, uh, you know, like there's a reason for yeah. them being there. Yeah, and <laughs> we got people stationed there. You know, here in Canada, Canadians there too. So, oh yeah, it's it's like when 9/11 happened. You know, a couple of weeks after, you know, like we were playing with some of the we were playing airsoft back in the day. You know, paintball type game. You know, and one of the guys was with the Canadian Special Forces that was playing with us. You know, and he said, "I can't make it this weekend. We're deploying." You know, like where? Uh, Afghanistan, you know, it's like, and nobody had been told that that Canadian special forces were being deployed, you know, like until a couple of months later. Yeah. You well, know. it turns out we're kind of badass in that regard. Yeah, but you know, it's like, what are we going to do and tell the Americans no, we're not going? <laughs> it's like <laughs> Canada always joins, you know, anything. You know, it's like we bring the beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we bring the beer and uh, we bring the fear to the hearts of everybody who goes up against us traditionally. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's Ever because we have, we have to, one. We've been very, very good at that. We have to train constantly, you know, like because we don't really have the weapons to use in other things. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're going to be training this this next couple of months. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, well, you know, constant training does, you know, create some very, very badass individuals. I know I was in the army for a for a period, and so I met some pretty uh, intense folks. Let's just say. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, I'm a military brat myself, so nice. I was on military bases all my childhood, you know, and. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's like met a lot of people, you know, like you're going, okay, Valcartier, you know, you have, you know, like, uh, yeah, that was a bad one Ameri American, American special like forces, you know, like you're being sent up there for winter training, you know, mm -hmm. and you get a bunch of Americans that have never gone cross country skiing in their lives oh, sweet with 50 children. pound packs. And it was just hilarious as kids watching this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those sweet summer children. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like, <laughs> it, it's, Fun stuff, you know, like, but all the, all these things led to, you know, you know, me at least being interested in gaming and all that, you know, yeah. computer games, you know, like Dungeon and Dragons, you know, it's like I've, I played like second edition AD&D when it first came out, you know, and, you know, it's things have gone a long way you know, when you look at what Dungeon and Dragons is now, because, hey, Oof. you know, if you play it's that got, old version, yeah. rats were deadly, you know, it's like you had, you know, 1d4 hit dice, you know, and the rat had the same amount as you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas nowadays... It's gone for a minor fantasy superhero game combined with a larger lifestyle brand. Yeah. Which people ugh. get but, together, you know, like, and, uh, you know, they basically want to play you know, and have an excuse to get away from, get out of the house or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like here in Montreal, you know, like you, you basically have the little, you know, like the, the, the slash bar slash gaming you know, yeah. cafe. Yeah. Yeah. We've you got know. a couple of those up here in Quebec City, too. You know, it's like, and that works, you know, because mm -hmm. 
a lot of the stores realize this, you know, back, you know, like 20 years ago, the, the stores that, you know, started selling, like having a little place you could play your games, you know, and they'd sell potato chips and, you know, cans of soda pop and candy bars and all that. And they soon found out that they were earning 30% of their money just from the, the junk food sales for people that were going of in course. there. Yeah. yeah. Back the, when the, I was posted in, uh, in Kingston over at the, the uh, signals uh, school there. I was had a regular traveler game over at uh, Nexus uh, Kingston Gaming Nexus, which was the store nearby near the base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but, yeah, basically they had all their games for sale and all that stuff, and there are a bunch of tables with you know so soft drinks available and stuff like that, and we just you know met up there and played them once a week. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's you know some people so they would make you know as I saying the ones that, that did these setups yeah made about thirty percent of their sales just in soda pop and and stuff like that yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus, and, it helps to build that com gaming community. Yeah, where you, you want have, a place you, know, you can get together, and that exactly. they're not going to be, you know, if you if you say picked up a book or whatever and spilled something on it, well, you're buying that book. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, you, you know, it's it ain't uh, a library. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not going to allow you to take it off the table. Can we use it here and bend the fold the, the cover over here so we can read the rules? It's like nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, and you know, people, you know, as you get older. You look at this stuff and go and say, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'll pay whatever it costs, you know, for, for, you know, food and drinks and all that, you know, yeah, you have to have you, a place to play a, because. Yeah. You rent a table, you have, you know, like, so that this space is our space for this uh, period uh, during the week. And then you just go there, you set up your, you know, gaming set, your setup, whether it's, you know, your weekly Axis and Allies game or your DD 5e or, you know, OSR du jour that you're playing that day yeah. and just, you know, go from, go from there. Yeah, and, you, and you have the, the the vanilla stuff to get in. You know, you start people off with Settlers of Catan, you know, the board <laughs> games. <laughs> yeah, and then you just gradually, you know, get through the entry drug level and you get them to the real hardcore stuff. Yeah, and you just keep them away from the Games Workshop players, you know, like that, you know, like that they're there, you know, like that. I've got my entire army painted up. You know, it's like I lost initiative. I'm walking away from the table. It's like, what? You know, <laughs> it's, come on, you know, it's like there's always a chance you could win. <laughs> you know, if, well, uh, that is always something that could, it's like, guys, it's a game. I know it's the game we're taking seriously here, but it's still just a game. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, it's important that people have fun with it. You know, it's like, yeah, it, it's a, like for our stuff, it's a giant robot miniature war game. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, if there's a rule that everybody doesn't like, ditch it. You know, it's like, come up with your own ha little house rules. You know, we've tried yeah. to streamline the rules down to be the, the most efficient now, you know, that we can to get, you know, like realistic gameplay. You know, like one thing we worked on with the last edition when we went to 3.1 was trying to get the um, the electronic warfare working a lot better. You mm -hmm. know, so we added in stuff where you can now have defense bubbles in the game. So you'll take one of your guys, instead of him basically trying to do an electronic warfare attack, he just puts up a defensive jamming bubble, you know, where and everybody within six inches of him gets an extra defense dice on ranged attacks. You know, yeah, but in effect, missiles and the like. Yeah, missiles or gunshots, you know, the, the cameras, the sensors are having trouble pinpointing because of the, the jamming in that area, mm -hmm. you know, and, but effectively what he is, you know, is you just painted that, that miniature, you know, like with a red shirt, you know, like from Star Trek, because everybody wants him dead now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, nobody likes the guy doing the jamming, that's for damn sure. Yeah, and then you'll find out the reason why you want to have some purely electronic warfare gears, you know, and say, okay, let's, yeah. I've got a weasel, I can counter jam that. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's like, yeah, ECM, and then you have ECCM for the counter countermeasures, and yeah, you've got that going on. Oh, well, even even just doing regular electronic warfare attacks, where you can yeah. do what you do, what's called a haywire attack, so you can try to fry your opponent's computer, and it just fries the computer for that turn. So at the end of the turn, like when you succeed, you put a little cripple token down on him, and if he's still alive by the end of the turn, that token gets removed as as long as he hasn't taken too much damage. Yeah. Yeah. But literally, you want to kill something fast, you haywire it, so you, and then it, when, when it's crippled, it only has one attack and defense dice instead of having, you know, like uh, starting off with normally two attack and two defense dice yeah, yeah. on its rolls. Yeah. So you that make was, it easier to kill. Exactly. That was something I liked a lot, uh, you know, going back to Jovian Chronicles for a second. In uh, Gundam, they have this weird kind of Minowski particle thing to explain why everybody is going at short range combat in space. Yeah. In the case of Jovian Chronicles, it's explained as. Yeah, there's enough ECM out there that, you know, trying to do this kind of stuff 
as would normally people think realistically fighting in space just doesn't work as well yeah. simply because there's enough ECM out there to countermeasure any kind of tracking and localization for those kinds of weapons. So you basically got to get in closer and we're actually be able to track and pinpoint where the person yeah. is exactly. It's, it's always, it's the Hollywood factor in all of this stuff, you know, where you got to have that scene where the two guys are fighting hand to hand or the ability mm-hmm. to track. Cause look, you know, you got Star Trek, uh, Starship battles, you know, they should be able to shoot from, you know, like, you know, like hundred thousand kilometers distance apart, you know, with their laser weaponry and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But or they're always right beside one another. Of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or firing off swarms of uh, drone missiles at, the, at each other with their yeah. phasers, mostly acting as point defense. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, it comes down to what is the visual thing, you know, where you want to have everything. So if we did a game, you know, like, cause again, go back to the first initial version of heavy gear, you know, you'll find that the ranges for the weapons, you know, like where we put real world weapon ranges back then, you know, and yeah. if you were going to play on the table, you could literally have stuff shooting from 12 feet away on the table, but you don't have a 12 foot table, <laughs> you know, because it had these extreme ranges. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Admittedly, like- I do appreciate that level of uh, realism in my RPGs quite a bit. I'm very much of the, you know, RPGs are meant to simulate the world. The rules of an RPG are meant to simulate the world you're playing in rather than being, you know, simulating the narrative you're playing in, if that makes any sense. There's a lot of RPGs nowadays that are more focused on telling a particular kind of story than they are in actually creating the like the laws of physics for the world you're in and allowing you to create a story using that, if that yeah. makes any kind of sense. And that's basically my preferred, you know, I'm a big, you know, Axe, Rune Quest, uh, you know, those kinds of RPGs, and, you know, Silhouette, obviously. Yeah. Oh, so you never, you never went for 90s. stuff like, uh, did you ever play Harn Master back in the day? Harn Master, no, but I've heard some good and bad things about it, depending yeah. on whose perspective. You, you had so game. much rolling in that game, you know, like it made Roll Master look simple. <laughs> you know, because Harn Master, you could basically do combat and eventually know that you scratched the guy on his left cheek. Mm, oh, yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful there was all these tables. tables you rolled on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah admittedly they're okay yes those do slow the game down but that feeling of just like grabbing a bunch of dice and rolling down okay how badly did i kill this guy it's just mwah, there's something to it <laughs> at yeah. least for uh, you know, gamers like me i guess <laughs> yeah well then silhouette you know like has the thing where you've got to put the, your bank of points that you start off with your characters you can basically have the same character over and over again you've just lost your experience points you know mm-hmm. for for you know the next game if he dies you know yeah because that's one thing you'll know, like that with the the fourth edition i've told the guys are going to make it a, where your characters can can survive a little bit longer because silhouette system was pretty deadly <laughs> for rpg <laughs> yeah well it made sense you're dealing with like high caliber firearms and stuff like that yeah. you're going into a fight with no armor on someone gets a solid hit you are going to either be knocked flat on your ass with a sucking chest wound, or you're going to be dead. There are very few people who can survive a 7.62 millimeter sniper shot to the face. Just in general. Yeah, well, even if you had a helmet on it, you know, like, you'd be rattled, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you'd have and a then, concussion no matter what. <laughs> exactly, and replace that with, like, a gear-mounted railgun, and all of a sudden, you're chunky salsa over the next uh, two square blocks. Oh, well, yeah, it's like... But, you know, right now, you know, like the way we've got things structured for the coming year, we're, we're going to have the two teams, like one that's working on the RPG, one that's working on the, the Heavy Gear Blitz game, mm-hmm. you know, working together, but, you know, like they're still working separately, you know, so we don't actually yeah. have, you know, like things slowing down on the RPG side because, you know, the, the tactical game is slowed down. Yeah, maintaining cross compatibility between the two lines. Yeah, and the storyline will move forward mostly through the RPG side. For the newer newer books we come out mm-hmm. and they're always going to have a section in those books for how you use this in the blitz game yeah because right now we're we're in the best spot to actually have battles you know i was actually having everything taking place during the war for terra nova because earth is sending all of its conquered forces to terra nova to try to take over the colony you know like and whereas as we move forward in the storyline in the future eventually we're going to be going off to caprice you know to the other earth colonies and then not everybody is there, you know. Like they're gonna, there's gonna be some limited forces that go there, but they're not not necessarily gonna be there where everybody's showing up, you know. Yeah, because the way uh, the uh, faster and light travel works in the heavy gear universe is via 
uh, you know, wormholes, basically the uh, yep. Kenhauser gates. And those are, there's like the micro gates that they've kind of starting to develop ways of getting around the current gate network, but trying to get from one place to another without getting detected and just, you know, having your entrance mined uh, from, here, from here to hell is definitely kind of difficult. I mean, the, the CEF was sending uh, people through these little tiny little gate coffins to try and yeah. infiltrate Terra Nova and cause a ruckus. As we saw, you know, during uh, Heavy Gear 2, that video game, which, god damn, I love that game. Mm-hmm. Well, they did an amazing job with that one. You know, oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the I, I like, had... Yeah, I like the first one, the 1997 one, but that one, that yeah. one is some good stuff. Yeah, sadly, the, the third one never came out, you know, like, because uh, mm. it was done, it was like uh, 80%, 80, 80 to 90% done. Really? And they were using the same, the game engine was actually the same uh, 3D engine that was used to animate the uh, dancing baby from Ally McBeal, the TV oh, show. Oh, God. Oh, it was it was the top end, you know. You're talking. Yeah. You had to have a Pentium three to be able to run, you know, Heavy Gear three. You know, like uh, yeah, because the pen, you need a Pentium two to to run Heavy Gear two. Mm. You know, well back then, you know, it's like you had anything less than that, it chunked you. Know? Yeah, but you know, uh, it's like these days with quad cores, you know. <laughs> it's yeah, like, now yeah, nowadays you have more problems getting the, those games to run simply because they're so old now, and you need special emulators and tweaks to actually get them to run a modern OS, uh, modern software, rather than the hardware being a problem. Oh yeah, it's, 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 with all the the stuff that we did with the team at the, at Activision, like they actually came up to Montreal, met with us, you know, like discussed the storyline, the elements, you know, for for the game. So they understood, and they they worked religiously with us, you know, like. Yeah. Taking the well, storyline too, obviously. Yeah, well, and they the, previously had worked with the uh, on the Mech Warrior games, Mech Warrior yeah. Mercenaries, the last one before they switched over to Heavy Gear. So, how does that work exactly? The licensing process, where when you want to have a video game company create a video game based on your IP, well, you license them the IP to use, like in a limited faction. You know, so mm -hmm. they had the computer game rights. You know, like. And they also had derivative rights, you know, to basically say if they wanted to port it over to a game engine like uh, mm -hmm. Nintendo or something like that afterwards, you know? yeah. But, you know, with Activision back in the day, it was all computer games, you know, at the time, you know, like they hadn't put stuff on PlayStation or anything like that at that point, you know, mm -hmm. things changed, you know, actually, one of the reasons why it did change was after Heavy Gear 2 came out and before Heavy Gear 3 was released, you know, or was to be released. They got Tony Hawk's on the brain. Do you remember the Tony Hawk's pro you know, extreme yeah, yeah, sports yeah. things? And they sold like 6 million copies of that. This is, that was a, the launching of really Activision becoming a main player. They mm -hmm. made so much money off of those things that they were able to buy Blizzard. You know? And then it became yeah. Activision Blizzard. You know? And then, and then from if, there if, to if, Legend. Well, if you, if you played World of Warcraft, you know, like initially I did, you know, and you, the vanilla WoW was, you know, like, you had to spend, like, hours and hours gaming, grinding to get a couple of gold pieces to prepare your guys to go for a raid, you know, and then Activision bought the game, you know, and took it over, and suddenly it was, like, it was easy to get gold, it was easy to level, you know, you know, like, and yeah. the 40-man 40 40-man raids, that went away, it went down to 25-man, you know, mm. you know, like, and they just tweaked the thing every couple of months to go and say, oh, okay, well, right now, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, what is it? The assassin, the stat, the guy that stabs one, the rogue or whatever, you know, is the, yeah. is the best thing, yeah. You know? Then the the warlock became the best thing, you know. It's like I, I played a warlock at one point, you know, in that, you know, and in a twenty five man raid, I was doing twenty percent of the damage for the entire raid. My one guy just dot 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 dot. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> nerf. Yep. Oh yeah, you're too overpowered. Yeah, you know? it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then they said, oh, let's bring in pandas into the game." I went, oh, "This, this is this is ridiculous." Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, get, it does bring to mind that whole, you know, and this is something that applies also to you know any kind of war game. Obviously, if you want to have you know balanced factions for whoever's playing, is like balancing all the different the different uh, you know game pieces is a bit like a balancing combat in an MMO in that regard, because especially if you're doing PvP and stuff like that. In that you can't have anything, you have like different niches for the different, you know, factions, some of them fight in a certain way. So you have to, A, manage to have all the different, you know, soldiers functioning within their niche. So like, you know, the CEF does a lot of, you know, Blitzkrieg style attacks with their hover tanks and stuff like that. They're very much hit fast, hit hard. 
whereas whereas the north has a lot of specialist units the south is a bit more you know standardized general purpose a little bit of everything uh, and all their different units and then you have stuff like uh, eden uh, eden which has a lot of weird vtol uh, capable uh, max uh, utopia which is a lot of you know drone combat drone warfare and giant yep. uh, the giant tank that you were talking about earlier so and caprice obviously with their mounts the you know quad and the hexapod max and trying to balance all that stuff up must be a headache and a half yeah luckily i don't take care of that that's the rules roaster <laughs> rooster for us yeah that he has to deal with all the stuff and go it's like okay how much is this first this worth you know and yeah. then getting reports back from play desks you know, and they report, it's like, oh, yeah, well, that seems about balanced, you know, like that we took these five gears against, you know, like these three mounts and it was a fair fight. You know, as long as you're like, if, if you're playing the mounts, you have to have some mountainous terrain because you're paying for each mount has the cost of it climbing up the side of the mountain factored in. Whereas gears normally have to have climbing equipment, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a limited movement. So maybe they'll have six movement points like a hunter. And yeah. every inch you want to go up costs two of those movement points. You know, so if you want to go up, you could go up three inches, but you'd be stuck on the side of the mountain with your back exposed. Yeah. Or you, you can go up, that mountain go up two inches. The top and, end. Yeah. Whereas the the Caprice player that has the mounts, they they don't pay that movement cost going up the side of the mountain. They can shoot at any point from from on the side of the mountain. But if they play on a desert terrain where it's all flat, well, they've paid a lot more threat value for their army and they have no advantage. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you, you got to have mixed battlefields, you know, like that people play yeah. in. Yeah. And combine arms tactics in those cases. You need to have different parts of your army that compensate for the failings of other parts of your army or their vulnerabilities in order yeah. to actually have that, you know, full force that can actually do the job that you want them to do. Yeah. Like we, we added in a, a rule for most of the gears and vehicles that are there saying that you can only take a maximum of two variants unless the stats say it, it's like a, a GP plus squad. That means you could take this unlimited number of that model ver model mm -hmm. in the GP squad. You know, but if you wanted to have like say the uh, the hunter destroyer, I think it only goes into fire support and maybe some strike squads, and you can only get two of them in your squad. You know, like uh, so you can't go and take like if if your combat group has uh, six guys, six one action guys in its primary part and its secondary part can have three more actions. Mm -hmm. You could only have two of these hunter destroyers in your primary then in your secondary where you have three more guys you could take two more of them there so you could have a total of four of those guys in your combat group out of nine yeah you know, but you can't have all nine yeah that that one type because it would be devastating but if, as soon as somebody gets you know like say he's got a rail gun that shoots a lot further than than the bazooka you know, like, well, you're toast, you know, until you run up to range with the railgun. <laughs> yeah, because those gears don't exactly have good ejection systems, do they? <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> it's like, unless you're playing in the RPG, then you'll have that emergency dice sort of stuff. You have to save your butt. Yeah. Well, you know, basically like, there, it's just you jumping out as opposed to, you know, hitting a button and just getting jettisoned out. Yeah. Unless you well, the, well, you're going to have the ability to in the in the fourth edition of the RPG to bring your your RPG players into Blitz, mm -hmm. and they're basically going to become like army commanders slash um, duelists, yeah? yeah? So if you have a regular hunter, it's only six threat value, but you could take your duelist, you know, with all the bells and whistles that it has available to it, different weapon options, yeah? You could boost that duelist from six to, you know, 20 points on the yeah. table. But, you know, it's like he's still only one guy that once you kill him, you know, you've taken out, you've gotten rid of, you know, 20 points of threat value on the table, you know, like, uh, so it's putting all your points into one guy is not necessarily the best thing, yeah? No, it is not. Especially since, you know, as you, even though it's not, possibly not quite as lethal as the previous editions of Heavy Gear were, it's still plenty lethal from what I've been able to see. Yeah. We're, we're trying to get the game to run, like, in five turns, so you're going to move everybody on the table for five turns, yeah? Mm -hmm. Five times, you know, and it's not always, you know, the game where at the start it was always, I kill you, you kill me. You know, like now yeah. we've gone and said, okay, there's objectives, yeah, mm -hmm. and you try to accomplish your objective. You might have kill the enemy army commanders, and that would be to kill the enemy army commander and his second in command. And if you kill both of them, you get one victory point for the first guy, one victory point for the second, so you can potentially get two victory points. The other guy could have another thing to hold some terrain. You know, he does his thing, he gets two victory points as well. Say, so you both tied at the end. Then we go and count the kills and the and these crippled tokens that are still on the machines on the table. 
So if we're tied at two, two victory points each, but you have three kills and I only have two, you win. Yeah. That's the deciding factor. Yeah. You can always play just, I kill you, you kill me. Yeah. But after a while, it gets boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, also you need, for something like that, you very much need the terrain to be, you know, more interesting. Because if it's just that simple an objective, you need, you know, additional stuff. That's where a heavy gear arena really uh, came in for that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that, that was sort of our inspire. Try to bring back heavy gear fighter from the original card game thing but it, it didn't work that well you know because mm. there's all the the counter the combos and the counters to the combos and that was all in a, in a big book and you had to flip back and forth pages you know like to go from i'm using this attack you know i can counter it and you have to flip back what what, what section was that <laughs> it's like okay yeah. there yeah we are thinking about doing a new version of of, of the heavy gear fighter slash heavy gear arena nice. that would basically be you know having the regular combat where you can punch and kick and just do the regular attacks that you'd see in Heavy Gear Blitz. But when you get to combos, we're thinking of basically doing a deck of like 50, two times 52, like two 52, pay, 52 card decks. You know? And we can get those now printed, print on demand through like drive through RPG as well. That would work and, rather well, I think. You know, and then have a thing where this robot would be allowing you to take so many attack cards, so many defense cards, so many special combo cards. You know? And you basically pull those from the the 104 card total and maybe mm -hmm. you'd have just the deck of 40 cards like you only have one third of the cards being used at any time you know? yeah and then it's like can you draw the cards you need to win you know before the yeah. opponent draws the cards he needs to to do the big attacks yeah yeah simulating kind of like you know you're jockeying for position waiting for an opportunity maybe that won't come you wait for yeah. your opponent to, to zig so you can zag in the direction take advantage well, of it's allowing state. regular attacks to go through like i can always go and say i'm going to shoot my gun at you or you know, I can I can basically run up and do do a kick or do a punch, but if you wanted to basically do the running jump kick, you know, where you say I start off back here, you know, like I run, jump into the air, and try to to kick your head, you know, like, and if you got the combo card, yeah, you can do that. Like this is the idea for the new version, you know, but yeah. the, and then the other person, if he doesn't have anything to counter the combo, but say he did have the defensive card that allows him to counter it, maybe he's allowed to grab your your leg as it's coming in for his head. And do a roundhouse and slam you down like a body slam. You know? <laughs> you know? you know? and, oh, but nice. all that would be as cards as opposed to flipping back and forth in the book. Because you had a lot of those options in Heavy Gear Arena. But you had to go and find them or be familiar with everything that your gear could do attack-wise and defense-wise. Yeah? Yeah. And you had like a, a tree of like if you went down this tree of different types of attacks or defensive things. Yeah? That that's what you would get. Yeah, you know, and it was just cumbersome, you know, like going back and forth, you know, you know mm. so a fight would take hours, you know, yeah, <laughs> because that's, you'd be that's often the a price you pay for depth is yeah. complexity. So it's it's a question of finding you don't want complexity for its own sake. So you basically have to choose. Do you want, you know, complexity with the level of complexity that you're com you're comfortable with and to what you want to apply it, essentially? Yeah, but th that's something that's being not worked on in the background. It's like sort of in the background of my head and a few other people that have been in, involved in it, you know, because mm -hmm. we still got so many other things that have to get done, you know, for the heavy yeah. gear RPG first, you know, like the, the next book, you know, for heavy gear blitz, you know, those things that's going So it's probably going to be not until 2025 when we actually get to anything for heavy gear arena slash heavy gear fighter. Yeah. Come back since Any we already know something what's... like for uh, Jovian Chronicles or anything like that, the other systems or are we really focusing right now. On no, the, there is going to be more stuff for Joe. Well, for the Jovian wars, as we call it, the mm -hmm. miniature battle game of that. Yeah. So Tony are again, our 3d modelist, you know, Tony Balterra, he's been working on the Mars and Mercury, you know, ships and exos, you know, already. So he's got about 80% of those done now. Nice. And our goal is sometime early next year to do a Kickstarter to basically do to get all of those ships done and available and john our our line developer for uh, for the, uh, the the jovian wars game you know has been working on the the new edition of that to bring it from beta you know like into a full fleshed version and do a, an actual book like a rule book sometime next year yeah because right now there is the the jovian worlds rules current beta is available online yep the uh, rules.jovianwars.blog that for everybody wants to take a look at the 1.2.4 version of them. And so fairly complete as you could definitely play. It's basically just a question of like tweaking, making sure through play testing, everything works out right. But they look pretty complete from what I've been able to look at so yep. far in terms and of it, like, you know, content. And John has put a few of the uh, just like paper counters, you know, like for the Mars and, and Mercury fleets mm -hmm. as well. 
you know, because that's going to be coming. Yeah, you know, but uh, it's they're not as like they're not as powerful as a Sega or the uh, the the Jovian forces, you know, because yeah, those are the heavy hitters. But they'll have stuff that's interesting, like uh, one of the 3D models that Tony has done actually has solar sails. And we've come up with a really cool way to actually have the miniature where you could either put the, the sails closed, where it sort of looks like an X shape in the front, you know, or you have yeah. them open where it actually have the, the billowing golden cloth or whatever that would be there between these posts, you know. Yeah. And we've looked at actually making 3D printing you know, like of the actual, those pieces when they're deployed with the billowing sail done in a, a transparent resin. Ooh. You know, like, so we could possibly get it, you know, printed or in a, like a, a, an amber colored, you know, like yellow transparent resin. And then you do the raised highlights with a gold paint. So it would yeah. look like a mylar sheet, you know, like in front. Yeah. Nice. Is this something you could like get, pop off the miniature and switch it on? If yeah. You you'd actually like... be able to, we're looking at actually being able to change the front of the ship. So you'd have nice. the, the sail collapsed where it looks like an X shape, you know, cause it's actually in between the X post would actually be the sail would be in between those two posts of metal that are mm -hmm. sort of like there. And then when it opens up, they sort of connect to one another and leave the, the sail building out in the front. Yeah. They still have engines cool. too, you know, because yeah. you can use this, now you, the yeah, sail to go you out of system. That. But you, yeah, you know, exactly. Like, you can use that now to avoid using burn points when you're trying to get from one place to the other because you're using the solar energy to transport yeah. yourself. You know, the, once once we start doing 3D printing of this stuff, you know, like for the that, that batch, it's going to be so much easier to do than... The molds that we had to make the size of them, like when we did the Garin ship, you know, like which is the, the tender ship for the the Jovian forces, you know, mm -hmm. That's, those are huge molds you know, to basically have these all these <laughs> yeah. panels, you know, because it's it's basically an O'Neill cylinder basically type thing, you know, that you could actually have, was big enough to put some of the other ships inside of it. Oh boy, yeah, yeah, like you'd have like this huge carrier, and inside you have frigates that would just you could deploy. Oh yeah, oh, there's stuff that I've seen like our Tony has been just teasing me with some stuff, you know, and he's actually done some of the Valhalla station, you know, and you're going, okay, how big is it? Big. Oh, it's 16 inches across. You know, it's like, okay, we're not, we're not going to sell that unless it's selling <laughs> the STL file. You know, it's like, oh boy. You know, one thing we'll be unveiling in the next month that Tony has completed is actually finished up the Baroness airship for Eden. Ooh, cool. You know, like, so all 3D model, we're actually getting test prints done. Of that right now with the guys over at Tiflin's workshop, you know, you know, because it's a huge monster, you know, like uh, when the entire kit is put together, Tony printed one to test it out, you know, it's uh, 10 inches long, you know, by nine inches wide, by five inches tall. Okay, that's a big mini. Yeah, you know, and he's even put inside of it, you know, like there's spots for like, the main guns, you know, like to have actually rare earth magnets inserted in them, you know, so you mm -hmm. could have them like and, and turning on you know, not being coming off the ship yeah mm -hmm. so there's actually slots in the in the hull slots underneath the turret part to put rare earth magnets yeah so okay just, so you can then just like you know move them around yeah cool but just leaving the 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 holes where you'd put the glue the magnets in yeah you know same thing even you want to have the gun the big main gun angle up and down well he's got spots to put magnets inside there yeah you know? so you mm -hmm. could angle the thing up and down and be it's held by magnets yeah sweet but it's, it's insane. We even had uh, when when we unveil it, you know, Taro even did some uh, some little crew members for the ship. Yeah, so our <laughs> our guy that does all the the 3D modeling of infantry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that thing's definitely gonna be a troop carrier at, at yeah. the very least. So it makes yeah, sense it's, it's, it's probably gonna be something where we we do like with uh, Teflon's workshop and tell them that people can get it printed on demand because. Just the size of the thing, you know, like we'd have to sell the thing if we were making, like if we made molds of our own the old way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'd probably spend six or seven hundred dollars in silicon just making one set of molds. Yeah. You know? That's how big the thing is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, like imagine if you also made the land ships to scale. Uh, we things were in the works, you know, at one point. Tony has been looking at stuff, you know, mm -hmm. you know, like and going, well, we could FDM print. Like Tony has actually FDM printed an Orca gear transport, you know, they get air. The aircraft, yeah, you know, like uh, he he did one of those, you know, like where he did FDM printing of it, you know, like the filament. He used two and a half spools mm. of filament. <laughs> I don't necessarily know a lot about three D printing, but I know that's a lot. Yeah. Oh, it it weighs ten pounds. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> oh. it has spaces where the door comes out in the back. You know, the spots oh, to, to have the gears inside. Yeah. You know. 
the the landing gear he did everything based on the the artwork you know and he okay. kept the landing gear to scale with what it was showing in the artwork and the weight of the mod, the miniature above it broke the landing gear oh, so no. he's, he had to do reinforced landing gear <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and you know one of the terra Novan land ships is like big enough to have several orcas land on it oh yeah well if you saw the old artwork that we or the old photos for the guys out in alberta mm-hmm. that, that that did a scale uh the vortex class land ship you know like to scale with the miniatures it's six feet long yeah you know like it, it was on like uh eight eight four by eight plywood you know like uh that they had at the store there in, Al- in edmonton at one point yeah you know and uh you know they they did everything you know where they had the double stacked gears down in the hangar bay and oh man Man, that'd be cool to see a uh, see in person. Yeah. I remember, oh. if, I think it was for the uh, one of the Activ- original Activision game. They did a giant, like life size gear hunter yeah, gear that was, that was built right in our offices in Montreal during that time. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know, Alain, exactly Alain, super, yeah, Alain supervised it. Yeah, you know, like he was the one that took the the scale model from the small thing, scaled it up with foam core, and then they cut out plywood, you know, balsa wood, plastic. And made it all in parts. It took an entire semi to ship, you know, awesome. to the first to the E three show, yeah. And oh, then they, man. then when they did heavy gear two, they sent it back to us and redid the paint scheme and changed from the grenade launcher to a twelve foot long bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, and turned it into a dark gear. Yep. Yeah, basically yeah. made a dark hunter upgrade, just like uh, Miranda had for a spinning cobra. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, it was black. Like the heavy gear two computer game was all about black talon going off to Caprice, you know. Yeah, you know, and uh, finding out what happened there. <laughs> yeah, and discovering the Terra Novas swiped their homework and has decided to make you know mechs of their own, bastards. Oh yeah, it's, everybody steals, you know, in, in war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you see something that works, copy. Yeah. yeah. Right now, we do, we know that uh, yeah, it's like tanks. Uh, they're they're sort of obsolete now. It's you know, you look at them and go, it's like one missile can take them out. Yeah. And then it turns out that no, used properly, they're still pretty useful. It's just a question of how you use it, I guess. Because yeah, well, you, you got to have air support. Yeah. You have to have air support superiority. If you don't have air superiority, you know, like your ground forces are toast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's one of it's, those things where you know, some people always keep claiming that you know, oh, von Clausewitz no longer applies. You know, the rules of war have completely changed. We can, we no longer have to have boots on the ground anymore. We can just win this war through air superiority you know but it's like dude shut up (laughs) you don't know what the hell you're talking about if you actually want to control ground you need boots on the ground and if you want them there it helps to have some armor to protect them a bit yeah you know but we did learn one thing the russians never changed they're still using cannon fodder (laughs) you know it's like what (laughs) uh well i mean it's not like they you know they hide uh, that much of this stuff the white papers for pretty much every uh major military are available for public viewing in terms of general you know geopolitical strategy are available publicly deliberately from everybody you can look it up but just you know okay department of defense white papers go Oh, yeah, this actually checks out. Yeah, this checks out. This checks out strategically. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they got future war plans for the next 20 years here. Okay. Yeah. Who wants a drink? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Americans have plans with, to invade everybody around the world. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. you know, just in case. You know, better safe than sorry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Canada, uh, not so much. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, but we still, we have the exact same thing. You can look up Canada's war plans too. At least, you know, not the top secret stuff, obviously, but, you know, general, uh, you know, strategy, strategic warfare and stuff like that. You can look up all this stuff. It's, yeah, it's you know, like, honestly, not that hard. Northern to Canada is attacked by Russia. First, the first thing, call yeah. the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they probably would have some yeah, some help, uh, really detection from Alaska. That's one of the advantages of having that there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Uh. It was interesting seeing, you know, like how we suddenly got the F-35, you know, after not wanting the F-35, you know, <laughs> you know and, and now it's like, oh, we're going to be getting some probably next year. Yeah. <laughs> About damn time. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there anything, I know, like, there's always, you know, the temptation to, you know, base stuff in history when you're doing, like, war games and stuff like that, because there's just so much war out there to base stuff on. But when you're doing something that's taking place in the future, science fiction and the like, 
how much use is historical references and historical you know information with regards to creating tactics and you know battle plans for your future factions considering that they're operating in theaters that have vastly different terrain in the case of alien landscapes mm-hmm. or like in Jovian Chronicles where they're in space, which we've never had an official war in, obviously. Well, but, we're, you know, we're lucky in that aspect because a lot of our players are actually ex-military. Yeah. You know, like the, the rooster is ex-military as well. You know, so it's like I've had guys that, you know, like have run demos for us and helped us out that, you know, work, you know, like with you know, special forces, you know, like different levels, you know, you know, we've had, even if you go back like for Jovian Chronicles, when we're doing that, you know, we had friends, you know, like that worked at JPL, <laughs> you know, like that were Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you know, and it's like, okay, does this make sense? You know, it's like, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because there are geeks everywhere, you know. Oh, yeah. And, Especially you know, like, in those uh, those departments. You know, I so mean, it's like, where does RP do RPGs come from? They come from war games. Where do war games come from? It's like Kriegspiel and that kind of stuff. These were, you know, army and military officer training tools, essentially. That is where wargaming came from. So there's that direct collection right there. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you never know who you're going to meet. You know, like over the years, you know, like at conventions, you just go, okay, what do you do? You know, it's like you're playing games, demo, doing demos, you know, just playing, you're shooting shit with people and you go, it's like, what do you, what do you do? You know, it's like, uh, you know, like uh, NBC, Nuclear Biological Chemical Corps. You know, it's like, what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am jotting down your contact information just in case. Oh, yeah. It's like in. You know, guy shows up at a convention with a Pelican case, you know, back when only U.S. Special Forces could get those, you know. Mm-hmm. You, now you can go buy them from Battle Foam and all that, you know, yeah. have to, you know. But back then, you know, it's like those things were special. And what was in it? You know, it was gaming books. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, they can fall from 10,000 feet and the case will survive. Yeah. Not sure about the books, but, you know, it's like. <laughs> well, you know, books, I think they'd be a bit dinged up. I think that'd be good. Yeah. You might break the spine a little bit, but yeah, but yeah. It's like uh, so we've been lucky. So when we want to have you know like ideas for how the game should be played, if we're saying that these are going to be you know, like a, a force that's going to be using more drones or whatever, yeah, you know like well, what? How does it work right now? Yeah, and mm-hmm. this was done before drones really came into play in this last year or so. Yeah, yeah. You know, like a lot of it was just speculation. But, you know, if we were to rewrite the book now, you know, it's like it's amazing what drones would be doing in the in the game rules now, you know, because who would have thought, you know, how how much you could get away with, you know, that yeah, mm-hmm. you can have a bunch of yahoos, you know, with a, a cell phone controlling a drone, dropping a grenade, you know, from above. <laughs> it's like, you know, nobody would have thought that you could get that level of accuracy, you know, like from off the shelf equipment, you know, basically, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. And the fact that basically they're recruiting, I've, like I've seen like images from drone control stations where you think they're just playing on something with a PlayStation controller. It's literally that that you know easy to control. In fact, that they're actually modeling after video game controllers, just because you know the people they're hiring for this stuff are so familiar already with those kinds of uh, control systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just don't use your video game controller. To control like a, a submarine going down to visit the Titanic, yeah. My understanding is that the video game controller did not have any problem with that. I yeah. use a Logitech controller for all my stuff, and I have never had any problems with it. So <laughs> <laughs> I vouch for those guys. They that stuff, from my understanding, had a whole bunch of other problems in terms of like yeah. how it's far down it was supposed to go, which was way higher than they actually went. So that's the main problem. Oh yeah, when when you find out that the agency that would have regulated them, you know, and actually you know, signed off on them, refused to actually even try certifying them. You know, you go, okay. It's, oh, dear, poor bastards. Oh, it's, 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 it's sad, you know, like that you just yeah. look at it and you go, but, you know, like now with all the details coming out, you just go, who would ever get in this thing? <laughs> it's like, especially rich people, you know, like you just go, you, you got- don't have to be smart to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, it's like, for us, you know, like, let's continue with the gaming side, you know, and, uh, you know, as, as we go forward, you know, like in the, in the coming years, we're going to move the storyline forward. Yeah. You know, like again. Bring our own the subs and Ar- with uh, the calling Atlantis. Uh, we're not going to be touching Atlantis for a little bit, I think, because mm-hmm. there's there's Jotunheim, there's Botany Bay, you know, like that are more interesting looking. Because, again, if you have a water world and most all the other robots in the game so far are designed for ground warfare, 
You know, like you sort of limit yourself. You go and land on a place where there's point, just yes. a few islands. You know? Yeah, point. <laughs> you know, so it's like, hey, boys, you know, it's like, but you're going to make us buy all these water gears, you know, now, you know, like uh, sounds or, like a Games Workshop yeah. move. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, whatever the hell it is. One thing I've always liked about the heavy gear is that all these different colonies were separated from each other for so long that they've developed their own technology bases and their own styles. They're fairly different from one another even though they are kind of recognizable as mechs in terms mm -hmm. of like that, because there was already that Walker technology from prior to the, you know, Earth's uh, retreat from the colonies. So they all had that to start with, essentially. Yeah, construction and, then, and yeah. engineering stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So on heavy gear, uh, the, the actual heavy gears, the gears on Terra Nova are recognizable as each other. And you have also the Striders, which are the more like, you know, battle techy kind of mech looking things. And you also have like gear striders that are a more recent thing like Cataphract, Scimitar, and stuff like that, which are these really, really big gears. And yep. then on Caprice, you have the mounts, obviously, and their own particular frames, which are kind of humanoid, but different. Like you said, the egg shape, stuff like that. Yep. The CEF obviously copy Terra Nova for theirs. And then you have uh, places like Utopia, which basically is, you know, complete nuclear holocaust hellscape. With drone combat for the most part, giant, you know, NBCKA, you protected tanks and powered armor for the most part. And on Eden, which is bizarre kind of neo-feudal, post-apocalyptic, crazy town. It's just, Eden is kind of odd to me, I have to admit. It's very... Yeah. Well, every, everything is different, you know? Like, we try to come up with something that's a little bit different on each one. You know, and Eden had, like, the... Was it the gate disaster or whatever that happened? Yeah, thing? it resulted or, you know, in massive amounts of meteor showers onto the planet that wrecked everything. Yeah. So, and like when we go back to Botany Bay, imagine what's going to happen with a prison colony, you know, like where they might have had, you know, the ori original ideas for that was like, what about pat labor? You know, where you had, you know, like uh, gears, like robots with uh, Smith and Weston, you know, like, uh, you know, like, you know, pistols and all that, you mm. know, but, you know, it's like, where we go with it, I don't know where we're going to go right now for the designs because we'll look at what's out there, you know, what's popular for Japanese animation if we come up with a better design, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when we go to Jotunheim, that can be something completely new. New Jerusalem, you know, like we're already working on stuff for that, you know, like so we know where we're going for that, but we're not showing anybody yet. <laughs> you know, I think people will like it when they when they see it. You know? but, yeah, you it's going to be like, interesting to see because that's a there are, you know, the north in Terra Nova is very religious, obviously, but New Jerusalem, not only is it a planet that was basically colonized by the church from inception, it's also a completely different religion, the uh, Jerusalemite uh, religion, which is basically kind of like a unification of various Abrahamic faiths versus the revisionism on Terra Nova, so there's bound to be some problems there. Yeah, yeah. well, you find, eventually we're going to find out, you know, like what, like the first fleet that the Earth sent back to New Jerusalem was never heard from again. You know, like, and we've already released some little hints in the, uh, and during the Kickstarter, you know, of uh, what's happened, you know, like, since then, you know, like, where apparently a second fleet that was sent to New Jerusalem by Earth is also not being heard back from. Like, when they, when they came back, you know, to take Terra Nova, they also sent another fleet back to New Jerusalem. Yeah, you know, that's like, gotta be worrying. You know, and the same thing, like, our, our Black Talon teams have not been heard back from that went you know, like before before this fleet was supposed to be sent, you know, mm -hmm. you know like uh, so what happened to Black Talon that went to find out what happened on New Jerusalem? Eventually we'll find out, you know, you know it's like, yeah. well, I'm looking forward to finding out, that's for damn sure. You know, and as we go forward after that, you know, like it's going to revert back to uh, mostly a, our original idea was sort of like island hopping during the Second World War, but planet mm -hmm. hopping, you know, to find out Terranovans go back to the different colonies to help liberate them, you know, like and also find new allies to go against Earth, you know, because Earth is still the big bad guy. They yeah. have all the resources, you know, like Earth founded everything, you know, it's it's got the manufacturing from all the, the solar system, you know, it's exactly, got gates, yeah. like out near the, the the gas giants, you know, it's got Mars, it's got, you know, you know it's got the, the, the fleet yards out around Saturn and Jupiter, you know? Yeah, and it's so got have, all the resources from the colonies that they successfully managed to subjugate as well. Yep, for the ones that they've resubjugated, yeah. But, you know, it's like, it's, it's going to be difficult for them, you know, but, you know, like Earth, you know, like we wanted to have them as like the, the fallen, you know, like parents sort of style, you know, like, and the Terranovans are basically like the, the people during the second world war, you know, 
where mm -hmm. they see that there's a major problem to deal with and they're going to do what has to be done to, to deal with a problem. Yeah. And not Even not this, they like, themselves well, don't necessarily get along very well. Yeah. Well, they, they hate one another's guts. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's like this is a bigger problem. We got to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, like you said, World War II, you have like the Western Allies, Soviet Union teaming up together to deal with the Japanese and the Germans and the Italians. Yep. And, you know, it's like it worked out. You know, it's like whoever wins, you know, like, you know, whether it's Terranova becomes a major player, you know, or is it Terranova in New Jerusalem, Terranova in Jotunheim, you know, so forth. Yeah. You know, who are going to be the, the guys that write history? Yeah. You know, if yeah. they do manage to succeed. Yeah. That's where the fun comes in of, of the guys that get to write the story because we'll tell them it's like this is who we want to win, this is what we want to happen, you know, like uh, come up with the stories alongside of it. That's why we've got these little tiny side stories. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we'd like to have some novels as well, you know, like that uh, would be cool. You know, yeah, for, I think there's enough backstory throughout, you know, all the you know the different uh, you know points in the history of the Heavy Gear universe. You could write a whole bunch of stuff. Oh the, yeah, there's all the, all these war, ideas we yeah. we had from back then. But when we licensed like the television series to Sony, all those ancillary, ancillary rights, you know, mm. were locked into that. We couldn't do comics, Damn. we couldn't do novels, we couldn't do couldn't do toys, like we couldn't do the <sighs> heavy gear bed sheet was all part of the, the, the merchandising rights for the that went with the T V series. Yeah. You know, so it basically, you know, it it blocked us, you know, for fifteen years, you know, because they did forty episode T V series, you know. But they didn't listen to us, you know, so it only went 40 episodes. It didn't get renewed, you know, like, uh, whereas if they'd probably followed our idea for the storyline, it probably would have gone for a couple more seasons, you know, like had the toys finally come out, you know, and, and so forth. You know? What was your idea for the storyline for that? Oh, we were all right with them taking Marcus becoming the the uh, the actual hero, you know, and winning the first season battling uh, Major Wallace, you know, mm -hmm. Colonel Wallace. You know? And... Uh, you know, then we would have had them come back for the rematch, you know, like the next season of, you know, like of the, the heavy gear arena type type, type setting for in Karadin. And as they're fighting, you know, like all the vid screens in the arena would have gone red with an alert, you know, announcing the destruction of Peace River. Oh, man. And then you would have had the Vanguard of Justice and the Shadow Dragons being teamed up together as Black Talon and going off to solve the Earth problem. Oh. So you would have had the two groups that hated one another's guts having to save one another's butts every episode. <laughs> yeah, eventually, Perfect. you know, you'd have Sebastian the Grell, you know, having to fight against his brethren, you know, like and you know, and uh, the kid having to look up, you know, like to the the really the army commander, you know, which was Wallace, you know, because he's mm -hmm. he's military, you know. But you know, you'd have a more complex storyline, you know, that could have been followed for seasons and seasons to go, you know? yeah, yeah. That didn't go that way. Yeah, it <laughs> so, didn't. Instead, it went the way of all reality shows. <laughs> yeah, it's like repetitive stuff, you know. It's like, and if you just ignore the uh, the hover gears, that, the hover boards that come in, you know, later on, where you're going, where the hell did this come from? <laughs> you know, we, we don't even have that in our game yet. You know, there's no hover <laughs> hover boards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they probably you know went over to the uh, Port Arthur and says, "Hey, um, you know that hover tech you guys got from the CEF? Yeah, yeah but that's I, that's uh, with the, that's with turbo that fans." Fun? That's yeah. what Turbo fans, the stuff they did in the in the show, you know, looked like it was just glowing and it was something like out of Back to the Future, you know, like with yeah. the, the hoverboards you know, with gears on them. Yeah, I'm <laughs> saying ideally that's what it, it would have ended up doing because I could see like, you know, that I could actually work as a something like, you know, a little uh, platform that a gear could get onto with some controls to hold onto and it works as a turbo fan kind of thing. So they could zip around really quick and then just disembark and go into, you know, regular infantry mode. A lot of things are opened up for us now, you know, it's like, but, you know, as I said before, you know, like if Hollywood is interested, I'm wanting to keep control, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just, it's, it's not about the money. It's about the control yeah. you know, and making sure that things happen, you know, and not just somebody gets the rights, you know, and then goes and slaps the name on it. And it's not, it's not heavy gear. Yeah. Yeah. And then sits on it for 15 years. Yep. Well, it's, it wasn't sitting on it. That's just the way the contract was phrased. If you basically you know, make this and it makes money and you pay royalties, you know, it automatically gets renewed for so many more years because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that go out there that, you know, like that even get greenlit and then, you know, like the, uh, the pilot is done and it doesn't get picked up by a network. 
you know, for a television show because the pilot is terrible. And it's just like, nope, we're not going to pay any more for that. And it's dead at that point. Yeah. You know, and at that point, it would just be they, they would get their five years or whatever, you know, from because they spent some money on it. But, you know, if it gets picked up, you know, then it suddenly it goes because that thing was done, was shown in Australia, shown in the States, shown in Canada. You know, like it's it got everywhere around the world. You know, you know yeah. like it's it got DVD releases as well. You know, like there are two, two DVD releases that they put out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just it. It would have been nice if, if it had been what we wanted it to be, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can't have everything. They Indeed. gave us a pile of money, you know. That's yeah, like, well, yeah. There's at least that. <laughs> at least got that out of it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, when you're a young, when you're young guys, young company, you know, because that was all back at the start. Yeah, you know? going, oh yeah, let's 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 take a chance. You know, it's like uh, yeah. If you don't try it, you know, you never know. Yeah, exactly. And plus, you know, for every uh, Heavy Gear the series, you get, you know, another, like, you know, Heavy Gear 2, for instance, like, in terms of, like, adherence to storyline and quality. So it's, you just got to try it out and see what happens. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, personally, I really hope you guys get a chance to do another uh, proper mech sim, like uh, those uh, Heavy Gear 1 and 2, because, damn, I love those games. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, if anything it does happen, it's going to be where a partnership between ReadingPod 9 and us. And another party, yeah, because mm -hmm. we're not a bunch of programmers, you know. It's like so we don't have that ability, but we'd want to be to be in there, you know, deciding on the story and again the look, yeah. You know, like and going saying, yeah, we're bringing the IP to the table, you know, like uh, you guys bring the, the programmers, you know, like and uh, we work together, you know, and uh, that way, you know, like we don't end up having any surprises, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You know, well. Uh, I certainly hope you guys have the best uh, of luck for not just for Heavy Gear and Joey Chronicles, but for everything else that you guys have pl planned for coming up. Where can people uh, go check out uh, everything that uh, DreamPod 9 has cooked up? Yeah, they just have to head over to our website, uh, DP9, so www.dp9.com. Great. Links for that will be in the description as well for that uh, pledge manager for the uh, Heavy Gear uh, 4 uh, role-playing game for people who want to make yeah. a late donation for, to the cause and uh, see what they can get out of it. Yeah, check get, that out. Get a an ebook version of the 480 page rule book. <laughs> or the, there's actually going to be a printed versions like a soft cover and hard cover as well. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that. For everybody else, this has been Mr. Robert Dubois, director of DreamPod 9. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Okay, well, have a nice night. Yeah, Take you care. too. And to all the other gearheads out there, we're ejecting. Bye bye. All primary objectives complete. Mission successful.